Okay, and we'll call the Estimates Committee meeting to order. This evening, our clerk is Julia Sipple, supported by Jennifer Page. Can you please call the roll? Councillor Utley. Here. Councillor McCreary. I am here. Councillor Antoski. Here. Councillor Vanderselt. Present. Councillor Sless. Present. Mayor Davis. Present. Councillor Van Tilborg. Present. Councillor Carpenter. Present. Councillor Wall. Present. Councillor Sicoli. Here. And Chair Martin. Here. Members of the committee, just a reminder that the following rules of, and procedures apply to the meeting of the Essence Committee. All motions must be moved and seconded. Each speaking opportunity for members is three minutes. There is no limit to the number of times a member can speak on the same question. As a reminder, please enter the January 20th meeting date in eScribe to participate in the voting. We will stop for a dinner break at approximately six o'clock. Members of the committee, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest or items on any of the items for tonight's budget agenda? Seeing none, can we have a recap of the budget numbers, please? Uh, thank you, through you, Chair Martin. We ended uh, Monday night uh, with a proposed citywide 2022 capital budget totaling $138,593,553. If you are using the revised uh, worksheet that was uh, distributed uh, yesterday, uh, there are some staff recommended projects that are proposed to be removed from this program at this time as they're no longer required. So I'll just go through those very briefly. Um, so uh, it's the first is reference number 283, which is the Lauren Towers hot water tank and expansion tank project totaling $100,000. And that project uh, was located at step 8C9 of the worksheet for this evening. So you'll notice that there's a bit of a strike through uh, through that project. The second one is reference number 190, which is the traffic signal battery backup system project within public works. That project totaled $90,000 and was located at step 9C48 of tonight's worksheet. So again, you'll notice that there's been a strike through through that project as well. Uh, third is reference number 192, which is an anti-graffiti traffic cabinet wrap project totaling $60,000. Again, within public works, this project um, was located at step 9C5050 of tonight's worksheet. And again, that project has uh, a strike through through it now. And then um, one additional project has been identified today as being no longer required. It is reference number 83, again, within uh, the public works section of tonight for the a new Grand River residential sewage pumping, pumping station and twin force mains. This project is within public works uh, step at 9C1818. That project totaled $4,079,000. So staff have identified that these four projects in total uh, no longer need to be considered along with the 2022 capital budget. So the updated citywide 2022 capital budget uh, for the start of this evening is $134,264,553. The citywide a uh, nine-year capital forecast for 2023 to 2031 is currently at $1,114,416,752. Um, if it's okay with you, Chair Martin, I'll just proceed into step 7A. Uh, just for clarification before that, the 10-year the number didn't change. So are these projects pushed back or are they being taken out? They're being taken out at this time, yes. Would it not affect the 10-year forecast then? I don't believe so. Uh, I know we can, uh, you can certainly ask okay. staff at the specific steps, but I do uh, know for certainty that um, 
the Lauren Towers project, as well as the most uh, recent one with respect to the Grand River sewage pumping station are no longer required and will not be uh, proposed later in the forecast. Okay, go ahead to step 7A then. Great, thank you. So we are starting um, tonight with the capital budget uh, for the chief administrative officer for 2022 and the 10 year capital plan. So we'll start first at step 7A with the 2022 capital budget for the CAO's office. And those projects are identified on page 581 of your capital budget document. That budget does total 471,000 $500 and consists of eight requests across uh, the commission, including communications and community engagement, economic development and tourism, and finance. Chair Martin, you can proceed to step 7B. Thank you. Uh, Brian Hutchins, and I'll ask you to make your presentation, please. Thank you, uh, you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to introduce uh, Maria Visaki, our Director of Communications. Sarah Monroe will be here for me from Economic Development. Uh, Kevin Finney is off for personal reasons, and as well as uh, Glenn Brown from the Sanderson Center. Joelle Daniels also reports to me as finance, and she will also be present as well. Um, some of you have been around the earth long enough to remember an old commercial that used to say, I'm not only the CEO, I'm also a client. Well, I'm not only the CAO, I'm also a general manager and have a commission. So it's odd, some, some CEOs do not have direct capital. I have uh, three or four directors that report to me and I double up as both kind of a general manager as well as a CAO. So I'm presenting on behalf of my commission as Joel mentioned tonight, so. Next slide. And I'm not selling the product that person, person used to sell, so. Um, you can see the developments and capital highlights. I already mentioned economic development and tourism master plan. You see some items under Sanderson Center modernization uh, through this, a series of audio visual replacements and the communications area city rebranding project. And as last but not certainly least is an implementation of Sally module. I'll explain all these in the budget software. Um, next slide, please. You know, some of the things uh, in my department is recovering from COVID-19. Uh, we have not, and I'll explain this in a minute, but we have not had an economic development strategy uh, since 2016. Uh, it's ran out and reflect uh, both on the current states as well as the future direction of the city, incorporating things such as the new municipal cultural plan and other factors. Uh, we're looking at modernizing the Sanderson Center position, a, a, a heritage theater to welcome audiences as identified in key strategies in the downtown revitalization and master culture plans. Very important tool in our community. Uh, implementation of finance resources required to better accurately budget salaries. And I'll explain that in a second as well. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see the budget as well as mentioned, $471,000 uh, for both the uh, forecast and as well as uh, for this year. And then next slide. So this is the, the base of the breakdown, economic development, the first on the first slide looked quite large. This was in the capital budget last year was deferred. So this year um, it was in when and council decided to defer it. So this year it's $120,000. And as I mentioned, uh, it, it, the last one was done in 2016. The last economic development strategy and tourism strategy was done in 2016, it expired last year. Most of the matters were dealt with. Uh, coming out of COVID, things have pivoted and shifted. it will be important to reflect both the current state and the future direction of city's economic development, and working with our local businesses to develop a plan in our, in our, in our cultural plans, as well as, as, well as our tourism. So we, we have $120,000 in there to do this project. The Sanderson Center, there's a number of projects. First one is the video project replacement, the 40,000 looking for a high definition video projector for the stage originally donated by the, to the Sanderson Center Foundation in 2013, now reaches life expectancy at the end of service life and needs to be replaced. We also have the speaker system replacement of uh, 135,000. And that's looking at the current line of array system dates from 2008 is expected to reach end of service life, provide liability and cost to repair. Second, last, the, the third last thing is the Sanderson Center main curtain replacement. Uh, there's parcel, sorry, there's um, 
looking at that's been deferred or can't, that was deferred from last year's capital due to kind of the lack of shows going on, but actually opening up from the stage main curtain replacement due to the end of service life 30 years. The drapery is prominent uh, visual element of this stage. And it's over 30 years old. The current curtain was made and installed as part of the 1990 restoration work of the theater and historical research conducted as part of the 2020 historic stage drapery project suggests the need further uh, further research to determine what drapery color was used in 1919. So um, that's the items for the Sanderson Center. I said Glenn Brown's here. You can explain those a little more. We also have the communications rebranding. Again, uh, looking at our communications and looking at consistent with our brands coming out of the city. We have a number of different ones throughout the city and looking at rebranding much of the communications and promote a more modern, innovative, and progressive brand voice identity, identity for the city of Brantford and prospective businesses and residents and tourists and students. Last but not least is the salary module. About 75 to 80% of our budget is salaries. Uh, we don't have a very strong salary module. We're doing many things by spreadsheets. And looking at that accurately can reflect this and I'm hoping we'll have a return on investment on the 75K when we start doing budgeting next year and the year after when we do our budgets, which is a large part of our operating budget as most of those members of council would know. Next slide. Thank you. And if there's any questions from myself, my directors, we'd, we'd be pleased to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Hutchings. Any questions? Councillor McCurry. You're still muted, Councillor. Uh, thank you. I, 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 perhaps you could tell my wife how to find a mute button, uh, Councillor Martin. I'm sure she'd appreciate that. Um, I hope she's not listening. Um, uh, job number 128, the, uh, the, uh, the deja vu of uh, logos. Uh, those of us who've been around a while recollect a similar project, a similar budget, and um, um, a less than um, positive outcome. Um, and I'll, I'll try to be I'll try to be positive, but um, I, I've really got to say that I have never heard a constituent say that we need a new logo. And if I'm misunderstanding that this would lead to a new logo, Maria, please correct me. Uh, through Chair Martin to Councillor McCreary. This is not about a new logo. The campaign that Brian was describing is a brand campaign to, as Brian mentioned, attract more tourists, uh, prospective businesses, uh, students and residents to the city. The, the second objective, which is nearly as important as the primary one, is to instill a sense of pride amongst citizens in our city and to highlight all of the um, diverse attributes and assets that the city has to feature. It's not about a logo. It's actually about um, getting uh, as many eyes as we can on a series of videos that we produced in 2019 that showcased the city. Um, um, uh, they have very differing uh, topics. Uh, one of them is specific to restaurants, for example. Another one is specific to the fact that the city is uh, business friendly. Um, another one talks about tourism attractions. And then there is a general brand video called My Branford, uh, which was shot with a number of residents who gave us testimonials as to why they want to continue or why they've chosen to live in Branford. So we had planned to launch this brand campaign in spring of 2020. And as you could imagine, uh, it was derailed because most of the footage was depicting imagery of things that couldn't be done <laughs> during a <laughs> lockdown. And so, uh, you know, then the plan was to release it in spring, summer 2021. And then we found ourselves in another wave um, so fingers crossed that we can we can get this out there in um, April, May of this year, ahead of the 2022 tourism season. Super, thank you very much. Uh, I, I will point out, though, that in the uh, detail sheet, the wording does say, comma, supported by an updated city logo. Maria, is that incorrect wording? 
It's dated wording, counselor. Okay. I think so that's I, the carryover from uh, years ago. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I would like to amend that wording uh, right now, if that's suitable to the chair. Yeah, you've gone over your three minutes, but go ahead. Uh, I'd just like to scratch uh, updated and uh, replace that with current. So Second be supported by, by a still? current logo, okay. Do we need any discussion on this? Seeing none, we'll call the question. Sorry, I'm just waiting on a vote from a few councillors. Um, Councillor Utley. Okay. Don't forget, you need to be in the January 20th meeting. Yeah, I, I couldn't, I uh, still couldn't get uh, uh, okay. some information to come up. So um, I, I'm in the affirmative. Okay, and Councillor McCreary. Uh, my token has expired according to eScribe, but I'm voting yes. Okay. And Mayor Davis. Yes. Thank you. The amendment carried on a recorded vote of 11 to 0. Those in favor, Mayor Davis, Councillor Sokoli, Vanderstelt, Utley, Sles McCreary, Martin, Carpenter, Antoski, Van Tilburg, and Wall. Okay, since we've moved into section 7C, um, capital projects 7C1 to 7C8, uh, if there's anything there that uh, people would like separated, then we'll go through the separated items and ask for questions and then uh, possible amendments. So is there anything people would like separated in projects one through eight? Councilor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you could just bear with me. I, um, I do have a number of them for questions, but my, uh, I'm trying to get my budget sheet to reload just Sorry. So, so, sorry, you said 7C, Mr. Chair? Yes, yeah, 7C1 through to 7C8. Um, okay. So, uh, number two, number four, number five, actually, and uh, six, seven, and eight. Thank you, that leaves one and three. Did anybody want to separate either one or three? Seeing none, Councilor McCurry, go ahead with your questions on uh, C2. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, this is job number 130. Um, I'm just hoping that uh, staff can indicate uh, what the tangible benefits were of the prior plan and um, what the benefits will be of approving this tonight. Through the chair to Councilor McCreary, this is Sarah Monroe, Manager of Tourism, Culture, and Sport. So the Economic Development and Tourism Strategy was last updated in 2016. Uh, this plan, we're also actually incorporating the Municipal Cultural Plan. That is a council priority. It was the last updated in 2014. So two really clear tangible benefits that come off the, the top of my head would include the um, film portfolio. So that was part of the original economic development strategy. We did quite a bit of community consultation, looked at comparator municipalities, and that recommendation told us to focus on the film sector. So year over year, that sector is growing because of our deliberate efforts to grow the sector. Um, the next one is that municipal cultural plan. So one of those updates was to develop a mid-sized performance space for the performing arts sector. And, as you all know, we have taken great strides in that, most recently contributing $150,000 towards a partnership with Wilfrid Laurier University. So moving forward, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly changed the global economy and post-recovery supply chains. They're gonna be very different than they were pre-pandemic. Reshoring of manufacturing for certain sectors Automotive, for example, it'll provide significant investment opportunities for Brantford based on our 
ideal location as well as the real estate that we are able to provide. And the strategy guides department work plans and ensures that our focus is what's most impactful for the community. At tourism culture, for example, are sectors that have been hit the fastest, the hardest, they're gonna take the longest to recover. So this strategy will build on our recovery efforts and it will also integrate brand new business units that just this month have moved into our department, including the standards or the airport and the farmer's market. And our most recent strategies would not incorporate the Sanderson Center. So a timely update to a strategic plan like this, it guides our department's day-to-day -day work as well as long-term planning. So it's important to ensure that we respond to our community's needs and we're capturing opportunities that bring strong economic impact to the community. Well, that's excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does anybody else have any questions on item C2? Did you wish to make a motion on that one, Councilor McCurry? Uh, negative. Then you have the floor for C4. Oh, thank you very much. This is job number 250, and it's the salary module for the budgeting software. Uh, reasoning given is that it would reduce the risk of errors. And I'm just wondering if we've experienced a bunch of errors uh, in doing it uh, via Excel, Joel? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I mean, certainly human error is, is something that we do deal with as part of the initial calculation and leading to a final budget. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that there's going in errors and budgets that we present to you, but it is a very labor intensive manual effort currently managing the multiple spreadsheets that are required for the calculation of salary and benefits across every union group that the city has, in addition to manually uploading that information into our uh, current Questica system as well. So certainly uh, uh, this solution will reduce both the manual effort required as well as the risk of human error in calculating those figures. Thanks very much, Joel. Does anyone else have any questions on this item? Councilor Van Tilburg. Actually, I have a technical problem happening right now. When I click on the project link and it normally takes me to the page that, let, that gives the description body, it's now crashing. Like it just comes up with an error. So as we move through, it's going to continue to crash. Um, advice before, please. Uh, sure, through you, Chair Martin, to Councillor Van Tilborg. Uh, if the link is not working for you, there is the page uh, number or reference ID for the project. So for example, 7C4, which we are currently discussing, is reference number 250. That also correlates to page 250 of the document. So if you I understood, but it doesn't, it doesn't take me to that description body. That gives you more details. Uh, That's what I'm losing right now. It's the meat of each project. In the symbols bar on the uh, right hand side, the fourth one up from the bottom, it's a page with it looks like binoculars. If you click on that, you can put in the page number and it will take you to the page. So for C4, it's page number 250. So if you click on that, type in 250, it'll take you to that page. The, the problem is that won't come up. <laughs> That's not working either? No. So, My report so doesn't have it. Was wor it was working like three minutes ago as I'm going through this. And then I just went and scanned ahead a bit. And now it just keeps saying... Uh, just gives me a, a a problem repeatedly occurred in this big long link regarding yeah. So, anyways, um, I will carry on, and uh, I still have questions for later. Okay, mine uh, doesn't seem to be working right anymore either. So it's probably not just uh, not just with your. <laughs> It's going to be a long night. Okay. Anything else on C4? Uh, Councillor Martin. Councillor Carpenter. If you go to number three, item three on the agenda where it says capital budget documents, that's where you'll type in the uh, number under the binoculars and it'll get you to the page number. Yeah, but he's, he's saying that that's not working for him. So 
Yeah, he may be down further in the actual um, uh, budget worksheet. Yeah, it depends if you're in the budget worksheet or the entire budget document. Mr. Chair, members may want to uh, avoid this in the future by downloading the document into PDF Expert and, and making your notes there. Uh, it always works. Very good. <laughs> good suggestion. Okay, if there's nothing further on C4, we'll go to C5. Councilor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. This is job number 263, and I, have, I do have a couple of questions for Mr. Brown. Good evening, Glenn. Hello. Uh, this relates to your speakers. I wonder if you could provide us some more detailed explanation in terms of number of speakers and, you know, without getting too tech geeky, um, giving us a, a bit of a broader explanation. Certainly, through the chair, uh, the, uh, the line array system are the ones that are on either side of the stage. Uh, they are, I believe, seven cabinets on each side. Uh, plus um, subwoofers that are uh, on the floor. And uh, this system in includes both the cabinets that are visible, the actual speakers, as well as the processing that is done on the back, uh, in the back room with the amplifiers that drive them. So it's a complete system that takes the, the signal from the soundboard uh, and translates that into the audience audio. Excellent, thank you. Now, if you'll remember last year, I think someone asked you a question, if you could do without something for another year and you ended up doing without. So if somebody asked you tonight, if you could put these off for another year, Glenn, what's the answer? The answer is yes, I can put this off for one year, but there is a risk that comes with that. Uh, and the risk is that if it fails, uh, these are older components that are no longer in any rental company's inventory. So uh, getting a replacement system up and running would be uh, challenging on short notice if it does fail. And, uh, and quite expensive. Now, you, you failed to follow my line of reasoning there. When I said you should, there's an answer you should give if you're asked if you can put it off for a year, the answer is no. To be honest, I, I can put it off for a year. Uh, it's just that we, we do take the risk. There's a financial risk attached to it, as well yeah, as a service level risk. I think you've made a good case for it. Thank you very much. Anyone else on this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, Councilor McCurry, you have the next item, the video projector replacement. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Glenn, um, it references the Sanderson Center Foundation as having deep pockets for other items. Uh, do they have any money? Well, um, they are an independent organization and they, they do a lot of fundraising. So they uh, are certainly developing a, a fund to help help support the theater. Uh, their, uh, their main purpose is to improve the capabilities of the theater rather than ongoing uh, capital replacement. Okay, that's super, thank you. Anything further on this item? Seeing none, Councillor McCurry of items T7. Uh, one Incur more, Glenn, it relates to your minor capital partial replacement of stage audio monitor equipment. Is that sort of a, um, a laundry list of smaller items? Yes, it is. This is, uh, uh, this is our opportunity to pick up equipment that uh, is a little too expensive to fit into our operating budget, um, but more related to specific uh, tasks. And in this, in this year, we're looking at the audio equipment for the stage. And you're gonna do that every year, right? You're gonna continue to replace stuff as you need it. We have uh, we do have an annual contribution of the fifteen thousand that we are uh, that we task towards specifically. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, that's actually uh, item C eight. Did anybody have any questions on that, Councilor McCurry? You skipped over C seven. Did you want to uh, ask about the curtain? Mr. Chair, what's the what's the job what's the job number on that? Kurt, okay, sorry. 265. Uh, no, I didn't have, sorry, I did not have a question on that. I misspoke. Okay. Uh, do members wish to make any motions to add to the proposed program as presented? Okay, 7E, do members wish to make any motions to amend the 2023 to 31 capital forecast as presented?
Councilor Carpenter. Yes, I'd like to ask a question on one, if I may. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. You're talking about the, uh, Glenn, you're talking about the roof on, the work on the roof, um, plaster work uh, coming coming up. Uh, could you, uh, is, that's down the road quite a ways is from previous water damage. Is, is that something that can wait or is that something that's gonna further erode? Uh, sorry, Councilor, you're, you, this is on the 10-year capital? Yes, uh, okay. yes. So we have um, one major project, which is the steel exterior roof, um, which is several years in the, down the line. And that's based on building condition assessments that facilities does. Uh, there is some plaster repair work in the lobby areas from water damage. Uh, it's, it's an appearance issue uh, rather than a, a further damage issue. So we're comfortable with the timing that we've got on there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Okay, where are we here? Okay, Joel Daniels, can you provide an overview for step 8A, please? Uh, yes, through you, Chair Martin. So step 8A is our next step where we'll be considering the 2022 capital budget and 10-year capital plan for the Community Services and Social Development Commission. So the projects that are identified for the 2022 capital budget uh, are identified on page 585 of the capital plan document. This budget uh, for 2022 totals $2,529,348. It consists of 21 projects within the housing uh, department funded through <clears throat> a combination of tax supported reserves and third party contributions. Councillor Martin, you can proceed to step, step 8B. Thank you. Marlene Miranda, General Manager of Community Services and Social Development. Can you pre present your, make, do your presentation, please. Thank you and good evening. Uh, through the chair, Marlene Miranda, General Manager of Community Services and uh, Social Development. I am pleased to share the CSSD Housing Capital Plan for 2022. I want to thank the housing and finance team for all their efforts on the development of the capital plan. Next slide, please. The capital plan focuses on maintaining the existing stock across the city of Brantford and, and the county of Brant. New bills have been previously approved in the 2021, in 2021, including the Trillium Way project during the 2021 estimates process and a conditional approval based on the cost sharing agreement, which was finalized, as you know, at the end of 2021 and 177 Colburn Street through an approval of SURF funding um, after the estimates process of 2021. Future updates will be provided as the projects progress. Next slide, please. Oh, actually that slide, go back, please. Uh, the next uh, couple slides provide uh, key housing project highlights. Uh, so the first project is a new study to complete asbestos inspections, which will update the asbestos containing materials or the ACMs, records of all city owned building, housing buildings uh, within the housing portfolio in compliance with the Ministry of Labour regulations. Next is the safety um, camera installation and upgrades, which have been expanded to improve the camera quality and perimeter views at 10 uh, housing locations. Each site has been evaluated and the scope of work completed. A collaborative procurement process with the security team for several sites um, is being coordinated. Next slide, please. The remaining highlights are projects to maintain the state of good repair of the housing stock based on the results of the uh, building conditions assessments completed in 2021. Of those projects over 100,000, um, which um, we've separated out the smaller projects. Staff are working closely and coordinating with public work staff on evaluating the scope of work to be completed and considering potential cost saving opportunities. As an example, public works staff have assessed all the parking lots and identified lots where repairs can be completed to expand the life of the lot versus a full replacement. Staff will continue to work with public works for recommendations to adjust the scope of work and combine projects for cost savings. As several of the projects um, on this slide are multiple year projects carried over from 2021. 
The Robertson um, Avenue roof, um, an engineering consultant has inspected the roof at the, at the site to investigate the cause of the sag sagging roof lines. It was identified that the cause of the sagging is due to the rafters being under designed and structurally inadequate to safely support code prescribed snow loads. The most cost effective option is to repair, um, to repair is to reinforce the existing framing. This will fix the structural issues and the shingle replacement will be completed in 2028 as recommended in the BCA. Next is the Winston Court uh, windows. The existing aluminum windows at Winston Court are approximately 30 years old and at the end of their life cycle. The cost for 2021 projects, so this is a multi-year project, uh, were uh, higher than expected. And due to the higher project cost, the third, the Glan Glanstone building um, at Winston Court was added to the 2022 with an additional $400,000 cost to complete this site. The third site is the biggest of the three sites and will include curtain wall system replacement, in addition, due to the building area, Gladstone is only permitted to have non-combustible construction or aluminum windows. These windows or these aluminum windows are higher than vinyl used at the other two sites. The Riverside Gardens Exterior Improvement Project is a collection of smaller initiatives for building exterior and landscape improvements to address the health and safety, maintenance and exterior appearance issues. Rather than um, separating out the project, they were combined um, together uh, for a larger project with a professionally planned landscape design for the entire site. The consultant site assessment and design were completed in 2021 and the construction work is to be done in 2022. The Eastdale Gardens, the parking um, lots, the curbs and the walkways is also a two year project to be completed in 2022 uh, with the consulting services that were completed in 2021 and the construction to be completed um, this year. The asphalt paving is um, in the east parking lot and remaining areas of the west parking area uh, show some uh, localized settlement and cracking. The perimeter uh, concrete curves are showing some pitting in various areas. The asphalt surface walkways and adjoining curves require replacement uh, to ensure safety. Heritage House is the next one and its exterior doors, windows, walls, flooring, uh, side, uh, stairway finishings um, are, to be, uh, are to repair the original building uh, wood, wooden doors, uh, replace the windows, exterior brick, walls and to replace the flooring in the corridor at the end of its life. The next one has been referenced by our treasurer. It was to replace the existing hot water and expansion um, tanks at the end of life with a new energy efficient cost saving system. The project was completed as stated in 2021 due to a failing hot water tank, which was urgent in nature to replace. Um, of the three tanks, one was not operating, the second was at risk of failing, leaving the 159 apartment building at risk of having only one tank to supply hot water. Therefore, the decision was made to replace the tanks at the end of 2021 using OFI funding. So it has been removed from the capital um, plan. Um, the next large project is um, really um, funds that we put aside um, for um, kitchen repairs across the housing stock. It is common practice um, that has been um, replacing um, kitchens during turnover um, between vacancies. In some cases, kitchens will be replaced uh, for in suit tenants. There are approximately um, 18 to 20 kitchens completed annually with an estimated cost of four to 7,000 depending on the unit type. The remainder of the projects um, are several small projects that have been are, are to maintain the state of good repairs um, for both counties um, below the hundred thousand dollars. Next slide, please. So some of the um, future, some of the. Um, future capital challenges and goals. The housing stock, as you're all aware, is aging. Much of the housing portfolio was built late in the late 60s through the early 1980s. As buildings age, costs increase to repair, replace major systems. The recent BCA capital plan and cost projections over the next 10 years is $12 million, 308,750. As these structures continue to age, increased efforts will be required to identify, plan, and execute maintenance projects to preserve their condition. 
As staff are currently only able to look a few years out to get capital projects implemented each year, given current asset management resources, there is a need for high range assessment plan and resources to manage risk of housing condition decline and provide direction for maintaining, developing, intensifying and or divesting. This will include um, energy audits. A staff report will be forthcoming to address the need for a long range assessment management plan. Then uh, the city target for zero um, GHG emissions is an important goal that staff support. However, it does introduce new project management challenges as significant additional investments in energy savings, uh, energy savings alternate energy projects will be required um, in coming years to achieve this goal. Finally, on this slide, creating increased affordable, uh, sorry, um, creating increased affordable housing options and accelerating uh, new housing development is critical. In 2021, to support the municipal housing master plan, the mayor's housing partnership task force created an affordable action plan to accelerate new housing development. New development offers opportunities for potential to reduce wait lists and or um, homelessness services with many units that are with more units that are totally accessible coupled with community support services partnership partnership staff and um, success strategically uh, connect units with attached um, support services. Next slide please. Just a high level summary page on, um, on the budget. Um, the 22 housing budget is 2,529,348 uh, uh, with third party funding of 330,253 um, um, for the total of 2,199,095 of the tax based um, contributions. And as noted um, previously by the treasurer, the slide has been adjusted from the chart in your agenda package to remove the 100,000 for the emergency work that was completed at Lauren Towers completed with grant endings. As always, grants will continue to be explored to reduce the tax based contributions. Next slide, please. This is um, just a slide of the, the projects already mentioned and the costs associated with each of those projects, which is also obviously within your packages. In closing, the wait list is approximately 1,450 households with some client uh, groupings waiting eight to 12 years. It will be important to maintain the current stock and develop new units as we move forward. Thank you for your time. The team is here to answer any of your questions. Thank you. That brings us to 8C. So if any members would like to separate any of the items one through four, Oh, we got a list already. Councillor McCurry. Mr. Chair, why don't I let somebody else go first? Okay, Councillor Antosky. Um, I will separate uh, 8C1. And, and just wondering when, is there, for general questions overall, when, when do you want that to happen? That's why we're separating items. If you have questions, you, you separate the item here and then you can ask your question. Um, I'll just ask it in any one of them then. Okay, it's general for all of them. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Councillor Sukoli. I had a question on 8C3, please. And Councillor Carpenter. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, I, I believe it's 12C would be Project 286. Okay, and Councillor McCurry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One, two, three, five, seven, 10, 12, 14, 18, 20. Okay, let's try that again. One, three, four. Um, one, two, three. Two, okay. Five, seven. 10, 12. 14. Oh, 10, 12. 14. 18 and 20? Correct. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Antosky, you asked for C1. 
Thank you. Just just a simple question. I think it may just be a wording issue on, on the first or second slide. It said new studies, asbestos inspections. I, the, the 190 is just to do the inspections, right? We are in no way, shape or form doing studies about the inspections. I just, it might be just a wording issue. Yeah, through the chair, Councillor Ontelski, that's correct. It's not, it, it, it is uh, to do the inspections and to update our records um, in compliance with the ministry. Thank you. And if I may ask my general question uh, here, Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. One of the challenges that you brought uh, up, um, Marlene, was in regard to the net zero. And, and certainly that's, you know, a challenge on the old older stock. Um, you referenced specifically project management, and, and I don't expect an answer here, but maybe if we can get a bit more of an outline in terms of where those challenges are, and are we reaching out to other communities that are certainly facing the same problems um, to see, you know, how they're meeting those challenges. And this may be, this may feed right into what the challenge is. Do we have someone that has an eye on the new products or the products that are working when we're doing all of these renovations and change outs, you know, does someone have an eye on whatever the most uh, efficient or the best ROI uh, on a roofing product, etc. So through the chair, um, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Deb and team, if I may. Um, so regarding the project management and resource needs to continue to maintain the current stock and um, enhance the stock or, or add to the stock and continue to maintain the new stock, uh, we will bring forward a report on what the on an asset management long range plan will be, uh, what that'll look like and what the, the asks for resources will be. So stay tuned. Uh, we're, we have that in the works to bring forward to council for your consideration. Uh, good good afternoon. I'm Deb Schlichter, Acting Director, Housing and Homeless Services. Uh, just to add to what Marlene has said uh, through the chair, um, every time we do a project, we are looking at um, energy saving aspects to that project. And um, there are larger projects, though, that relate to, uh, at some point, you have to decide, uh, do you keep repairing a building or is, is there... Um, a building where you're spending a lot on repairs and replacements. And so this is the long range asset management plan that's that's needed. And that's the report that, that Marlene was addressing. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Councillor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Um, the inspections uh, cited here, do they include air sampling in living spaces? Uh, so through the chair, um, I'm going to ask Donna um, if she could answer that, or, or Deb, if I may, just on the specificness of what's all included in the inspections. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Donna Kirshnoff, Manager of Housing Operations, and through the chair. Um, typically, the um, inspections for um, asbestos do not include air sampling. At this time, it is a physical inspection. And, um, you know, I, this is something that I can look into in further detail, but my understanding, it's just physical. Okay. Um, now, the wording says, and to update housing's asbestos inventory. So do we have an asbestos inventory for every building? At this time, we do, yes. So if we're not doing air sampling, um, what's the point? The point, it, the last inspection was completed in 2013. So while we do continue to go in on an annual basis to um, check the ACMs to make sure that uh, no areas are disturbed, we do need that professional opinion to stay, um, just to review the state of the ACMs to see if there's any further containment that's required or abatement. Is any of the asbestos present in basements? In some, yes. Would we not be better off spending our money abating that asbestos, which is in living spaces? 
If it's being disturbed, um, yes, it would be. Um, or if we are going to go in to do any type of repair that would disturb any contained asbestos, then yes, we would do some abatement. But if it is secured, if it is sealed, and um, it is the, of the opinion of the, um, of the uh, uh, contractor, um, then we won't disturb it. Does the province of Ontario mandate an annual inspection um, for ACM? Yes, they do through the Ministry of Labor. Okay, I wonder if you could send us that statute, please. And thank you very much, Donna, for your answer. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter. Hey, Mr. Chair, it's on the same lines, uh, do we also check for uh, uh, mold? Uh, do we do mold remediation and mold testing as well? Through the chair. Um, we do not go in um, and uh, test or inspect the way we would through the ACMs. When it comes to mold, uh, most often it's when it's reported to us, then we would hire a contractor to go in and do a proper inspection of the mold. Thank you. Seeing nothing further on one, Councillor McCurry, you had two. Um, Pardon me, Mr. Chair, but I, when I've got my spreadsheet up, I don't see the, the uh, reference. I, I'm talking about the next one would be job 134. Yeah, that's 8C2. Yes, thank you very much. This relates to Brent and Lauren Towers additional parking. Um, would staff be able to tell us uh, how many units we have on the site and how many parking spots currently? There. Um, we currently have 362 apartments between Lauren and Brant Towers. And unfortunately, at this time, I do not have a count of how many parking spots we have, but we do know that uh, through our waiting list, uh, with the number of individuals waiting for parking spots and to ensure that we have adequate parking for our contractors, support um, programming staff, as well as staff to visit the site, we need an additional 30 spots. Donna, where the heck are you going to shoehorn those in? Um, and that's why we are going to um, investigate, um, you know, any future development with our public works department to see whether or not they would have the expertise to be able to provide to us to see if there's any of the green areas that we may be able, may be able to expand on. But we believe that um, upon the entrance off of Ford View, there may be future, there may be opportunity for some expansion in that area. Is there a cul-de-sac there? Um, no, there is not. Okay. Uh, I wonder if you might be kind enough to send us uh, just a memo telling us how many current spots you've got, Donna, please. And thanks Certainly. for your response. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter. Thank you. Councilor McCurry sparked, sparked in some, some questions for me. So uh, Donna, on the parking spaces, are the parking spaces designed at the old standard or at our new standard, which is a smaller parking space, you know? The while the um, current, um, I can I can definitely say that for the accessible units, they are current standards. Um, we do have uh, quite uh, you know adequate space for the accessible units. Uh, for the regular parking spots, um, I, I can't answer that at this time, but I could look into that and include that uh, with the memo that has been previously asked yeah, of us. Because my understanding would be that would be at the old standard. The new standard would provide you a lot more spaces. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Donna. Donna, uh, is there adequate space for um, family members uh, to visit uh, visit their loved ones? At this time, the parking is very limited. We have approximately four parking spots over at the side. And yes, it, this is why this is uh, being requested, is to ensure that we do have adequate spots. Um, it's during the daytime. Um, we do have a lot of attendants that are in and out, but it is in the evening hours when everyone is home. And um, we, we hope that we would be able to, um, you know, have those 30 spots that are being used by staff during the day, they would be let up so that then family members can come and visit their uh, loved ones in the evenings and on weekends. Four, four spots, that's, uh, that's, that's more than tight. Um, so anyway, thank you, Donna. Thank you. Councillor Vanderstone. Thank you, Chair Martin, through you to Donna as well. Donna, the official parking space count 
is one thing, but the unofficial is quite another. Uh, you're, you're, you are familiar as well as I am with the parking, the gravel parking lot, uh, quite a ways east of the two buildings. And the fact that many people choose to park on some of the side streets in the area just to gain access to the building because there is no room in the parking lot, uh, not only assigned spaces, but uh, there's simply not enough. Um, do you have, are there any observations um, based on how many times, you know, there's spillover parking into all those other areas just to gain access, we, either family or friends or professionals? Um, through the chair at this time, Councillor, we do not have that information. It's not being reported. Um, you know, I, I just, I don't have that information at this time. Yeah, I, although you can't report it, it is, it is being experienced. So I just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Donna. Thank, thank you. you sir. Are the parking spots assigned currently? Do the, do the residents have an assigned spot? Um, at this time, they're not assigned parking spots. The tenants each have a parking permit in their, their, their window. So it allows us to know who is parking in um, designated tenant spots so that we can follow through on enforcement if required. Okay, and do any units have more than one spot? If there are more than one persons living in a unit um, and they each have a car, then yes but it's not more than one person per, um, one parking spot per person. Okay, and do you have any problem with derelict vehicles? Like are there vehicles that don't move for months at a time? Um, I, this is something that a property manager would follow up on in a timely manner to ensure that uh, all vehicles are roadworthy. Um, but um, to date, I don't have any uh, record of any complaints that we receive on derelict vehicles. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wall. I love talking about parking. Who enforces the parking? Is it bylaw? Yes, it is. Are there, is there a record of issues? Excuse me, could you repeat that please? Sorry, is there a record of issues? Is there, there are at times um, where we have tenants or um, non-tenants visiting the building and vehicles are there and we've had to have a uh, bylaw come in and enforce. So I'm not entirely familiar with the history of this building, but I guess it was originally built to have people live in it and have people parking there. So why is parking an issue? Like, so, is there not an opportunity to build up or down or under or over? Or? So when the building was built in 1970, traditionally, um, because it is a seniors building, um, at that time, the expectation is that the seniors wouldn't be driving as they are today. And so we find that a lot of seniors are, you know, they're still mobile, they're still driving their vehicles and that. Um, as for moving up, uh, up or down, um, you know, this could be something that we could consider. Uh, parking under grade and above grade is extremely um, expensive. And this is why at this time we want to look at, look at uh, possible expansion and see what we can do on grade. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Councillor Schles. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll throw you again to Donna. Donna, it, it, you indicated that there's parking there for staff. Uh, are, are they designated uh, parking spots? No, um, we do have a few parking spots at the side that we use for our contractors, but for our staff, we typically um, will park in behind um, some of the um, um, garbage containers to avoid using any spots that the tenants could use. Okay, yeah, that was my concern. I didn't know or if they were designated and they were close to the doors, uh, it would make sense not to be there, uh, simply because you're dealing with, with aged folks that would like to be closer to their doors. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have nothing further on that one. We'll move on to HC3. Security cameras, multiple locations. Councillor Sokola, you asked for this one. Thank you. I'm going to give Donna a bit of a break. Um, and I actually just had someone email me this afternoon from Lauren Towers to ask me about their security cameras. And so I guess this question is uh, through you, Chair Martin, to Marlene. I think I heard you say it very quickly at the beginning of the presentation, but if you could just confirm for me that... Uh, Lauren Towers uh, falls under the various housing locations definition 
here, that would be great. Uh, through the chair, I can confirm. Thank you. Thank you very much. They'll be very happy about that. Thank you. Councillor McCurry. Uh, thank you, Chair. And you're doing uh, splendidly tonight, I might add. Um, so with respect to installing cameras, um, Marlene, I, I trust that they're going to be of sufficient resolution to be able to identify culprits. So through the chair to uh, Councillor McCreary, that is correct. Part of the challenge has been the quality of the cameras. Um, primarily, uh, we noted that at Lauren Towers and Brent Towers. So um, that is definitely in the scope of work to ensure um, improved quality and the view of the perimeter so that we have better view and better footage of the cameras that will be installed. Now, um, I've got to think that uh, anybody that has... Um, their basic wits about them are gonna be committing crimes of opportunity, probably when it's dark out mostly. Um, so is there going to be a test for the appropriate illumination in the vicinity of these cameras to ensure that they actually are, uh, faces are actually visible if, if, uh, if shown? Uh, so through the chair, I'm going to ask um, Donna if she can answer the question regarding the specific scope of the cameras and the illumination factor. Thank you, through the chair. Um, unfortunately, I can't answer that right at the moment. Um, Rick Cox, I believe, is available and perhaps he would have more information to share. Thank you very much, Donna. Yes, the uh, design for the camera systems that we integrated for the uh, downtown camera systems, as well as the housing deployment was all designed with, uh, with the uh, understanding of the lighting in the vicinities of where the cameras are being placed. So uh, Councillor McCurry through the chair to answer your question, lighting was uh, taken into uh, consideration in the design of the location and the specifications of the camera devices being used. Well, that's excellent, thank you, Rick. And uh, with respect to uh, the availability of film for evidence, um, could you explain how, the, how we store images and like the length of time and so on? Through the chair, the uh, each location has a slightly different, uh, or may have a slightly different storage strategy depending on how effective the network connection is between that location and the the city's main data centers. But where there is strong data centers, all of the uh, the uh, the fiber connections bring the information back to store in the city's main data centers. And where the connection is not adequate to that task then we store locally and typically it's about a 30-day retention depending on the activity at the site and there's no additional uh, staffing requirements to do this the overall cctv camera program uh, and monitoring those cameras is part of the uh, estimates discussion further on uh, in the process tonight, or not tonight, but later on in the in the year. But at this point, it's a uh, it, there is no staff uh, monitoring the cameras live, and there's no additional staff in place to do that. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Councillor Slas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Rick. Rick, did, did I understand you correctly that? The placement of the camera is dictated by the amount of light available? Not dictated, uh, Councillor Sless, through the chair, uh, although where there is light uh, is was taken into account in terms of the type of camera and the uh, location that it was put. So we put the cameras where, where they were placed to catch, catch the footage we would need in terms of entrance and exits and faces and those kinds of things, but we used... Um, um, you know, the design thinking incorporated consideration of the available light and what kind of device was was used. Okay, because it, it sounded to me when you first indicated it, they were dictated by light and, and I would have thought we would have created light if we needed light. Um, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing nothing further on this item, we'll move to the next section, 8C5, Robertson Housing Roof Structure Replacement. Councilor McCurry. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, could somebody say when these duplexes were built? Through the chair, through in the 50s. They okay. were. Um... 
50s. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, and how long have the sagging uh, roof members been uh, a problem? Over the past year. Okay. Uh, so it's a, it's kind of a sudden onset then. Does it present any sort of life safety issue? Not at all. Okay. And what said, maybe this is drilling down a bit, but do you know the size of the rafters? Um, I could get that information to you, but I don't know right at the moment, no. No, I, I don't need to create more work for you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Seeing nobody else wanting to speak to this item, next one is uh, C7, Councilor McCurry. Heritage House, exterior doors, windows, and walls. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, for the for the delay. Heritage House, could you remind me whether that's the YMCA building or the building beside it? Heritage House is the YMC, uh, YC, uh, YCMA building in the front of Queen Street. We'll just Lucy Marco is at the back. Yes. Lucy yeah. Marco is at Thank the back. You. Okay. Yes, so what was yes, uh, yes. the date of our renovation of that way back when probably was, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe. Um, and all this stuff is, is, uh, is expiring on us. That is correct. The, the, the repairs that are, um, being recommended today are um, repairs that have been identified through the building condition assessment. Okay, well, thank you very much. Would these be materials that were replaced during the renovation or are these uh, items that were carried over from the old building? I believe that some of the items that are being replaced here are being recommended to be replaced are at end of life. Okay. Um, C10, Councilor McCurry, Lauren Towers, bathroom risers. Oh, um, sorry, I skipped one. Uh, Eastdale Gardens, no. Yeah, yeah, 10, Lauren Towers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I thought we had fixed all our plumbing, our longstanding plumbing problems in there dating back to the construction date. Um, these are, are these just the local plumbing that's between the wall and the fixtures? So what we're uh, proposing here are the risers. So this would be the internal, this would be for the, the, the plumbing um, through um, the entire building. So um, the $65,000 is for um, the fittings. So we did some work um, during um, the year um, to test one of our risers to see how much it would cost just to change out the fittings rather than all of the plumbing for cost saving purposes. And uh, so what we've uh, decided to do here was just go through and change out all of the fittings. Sorry, all of the fittings, Donna. So that would be all of the clamps, all of the um, all of the uh, connectors. Um, this would be um, uh, instead of replacing all of the piping, uh, where you where we um, experience most of the leaks throughout is with the fittings where the coupling, where the where the pipes are being joined. So this is what is breaking down, and so we are going to replace just the fittings. Okay, thank you. Is that on copper piping? At this time, I can't answer that question. Okay. I could get that answer for you. No. Seeing nothing else on this item. Uh, Walker's Green Fan Coil Unit, Councilor McCurry. Mr. Chair, what's the job number? 285. No, that wasn't, uh, I wanted the next one, number 286. Okay, Councilor Carpenter asked for that one, so we'll let him go first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and to staff, this is a this is twenty three thousand five twenty. What does that get us started? Because then twenty twenty three, we've got three hundred forty two thousand dollars in there, and I see that's to replace all the aluminum wiring. And this is the property that's at six seventy six Brayshire Housing Project. So uh, is is uh, one to do a study, or is one to replace the uh, GFIs? through the chair so for the um 23,520 that is for the pre-design 
um, so that we can go in and um, have um, a scope. And then um, with that scope, then we would go out and source the job for 2023. So the 2023 number of $342,000 and seven twenty uh, is what's that for then? Do we just, just the placeholder? Yeah, that, that would be the replacement. So that is the total amount that was identified in the building condition assessment. Um, and then for the, the, um, the uh, pre-design is to, um, to hire a um, electricians to help um, with the design of the scope of work so that we can go out and do a proper RFQ for this particular job. So currently it doesn't have GFIs within, uh, within 1.5 meters of a, of a water, water outlet? The, this could this this could be um, the case here. I, I don't have the specifics, but this could be the case. Yes. Okay. And do we know if we if we go to new GFIs, does that means new wiring for that for that for that GFI for sure? Because we're going to go to twenty amp now, right? Okay. All right. Uh, and just a general question for Marlene. And Marlene, in your presentation, you said uh, we will endeavor to reduce the tax-based contributions to this file. Um, could, could you give me a better explanation of that, please? So through the chair um, to Councillor Carpenter, um, we're working with uh, Public Works and I did give an example of the parking lot. So as we move forward um, from the building um, conditions assessments, we're also working with Public Works uh, to determine um, what the scope of work should be, where we can find some efficiencies, where we can work collaboratively with Public Works and put out joint RFPs. Um, so the BCA, uh, as you know, are estimates um, moving forward. So we will be working with Public Works and hopeful that we will find um, savings as we move forward for these projects. Okay, so you're talking about, you, you are talking about savings. You're not talking about where council allocates tax revenue towards housing. We're not gonna try and reduce the tax portion somewhere else to offset that then. Okay, I, it's clear it's just for savings and your efficiencies in your work, thank you. Councillor McCurry. Uh, sure, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Councillor Carpenter for that question. I hadn't realized that that was for the design of pre-engineering, even though it's uh, pretty clear in line number three. Um, this, I, I really, I, it really gets kind of frustrating to see us spending money on consultancy. Um, this would seem to be a pretty straightforward uh, piece of electrical work which any licensed electrician could probably do uh, based on a quick look at it and code. Um, do we really need to spend the money on an engineer when we've probably got somebody in public works who could write the spec and the electrician could do the work? Uh, it, it just seems, I mean, it's not, I shouldn't say it's not a lot of money because Larry may be watching tonight, but um, um, gee, you know, it's, we do have a, an infrastructure deficit and I, I hate like heck to see us spend even that kind of money on a consultant when the trades can probably do that for us. Uh, so through the chair, um, I can't speak specifically to what uh, Public Works is, is able to do from that expertise. However, um, I can confirm and commit uh, to continued works with Public Works. That's been an ongoing um, activity for the for this last year, um, and we will seek their guidance and expertise to see if it it could be completed in house um, and um, and proceed that way if that's the best way to proceed as we move forward. But we are working with them to find those efficiencies and those savings uh, in house uh, wherever we possibly can. Thanks very much, Marlene. And do we know the date of install of the electrical panels? The, like the ones that we have in there now? Um, through the chair, I'm gonna have to turn it over for that specificness uh, to Donna, if I may. Through the chair, um, I believe uh, I, that they are originals um, when the when the property was built. So that'd be like 1975, maybe. So for Daleview Gardens, it would be in the 70s and 80s. Yes, okay. 70s. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. I'm just wondering why we're replacing aluminum wiring. It's been used for for years. It's stood up for years. Have you had any problems with it? Through the chair, 
to date, we haven't had any problems, but it has been identified through the building condition assessment that the condition of the existing is in poor condition. Okay, because uh, my house was built in the same area and the aluminum wiring, it is just fine. I just had the uh, the switches and receptacles all pigtailed and... Uh... Okay. 814, Councillor McCurry, Walker's Glen parking lot, curbs, walkways and railings. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Would somebody know the date of construction of Walker's Green? It looks like it's 70s as well. Well, I don't have the, through the chair, while well, I don't have the exact date, um, but I believe you're correct. Uh, this was developed in the 70s. Okay. Um, now, what's the, uh, what is the useful life of a curb? I'm sorry, that's- through the chair, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Um, I know in the fifth ward, there are some curbs that are hundred years old. Um, Walker Screens curbs are, you know, not that old, and I, I just wonder why we're uh, when I when I see City of Bradford doing work, uh, we don't replace the curbs when we uh, do the roadway surface necessarily. Is that absolutely essential, or is it simply expedient to do it that way? So during my um, last visit to the building, um, the um, curbs where we have had some of the handrail posts. Um, and they were put right into the concrete, they're eroding. So this is where we find that the curbs need to be replaced is uh, around a lot of the handrails, which we have a lot of because of the slope of the property and because it is a senior's building. So there are excessive handrails and um, they are eroding um, at the bottom. Therefore, the concrete is falling, which is affecting the, the, the whole, um, the integrity of the curb. Excellent, thanks for that, Donna. And item 18, Councilor McCurry, Sunrise Villa, exterior windows and doors. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. This is the, uh, this is the Burford uh, uh, facility, correct? correct? This is correct, yes. Um, we have, this is like, uh, what, 12, 14, 16 units, Donna? Something like that? Uh, it is a, a Sunrise is a 12 unit um, building, yes. We have some extraneous costs there versus other facilities, namely due to the um, the uh, rather unique qualities of the Burford water supply. Um, do our annual operating costs still bear out uh, retaining this in our portfolio? Yes, there is an expense for the wells. Um, we, we divested uh, singles in the city of Brantford. Uh, is, is it worth having a look at divesting this asset um, uh, for the same reason we did that? Because perhaps we can operate uh, more efficiently with a, with a new structure rather than maintaining this one? Uh, through you to, through the chair, um, there, the reason why we are suggesting doing that long range asset management plan is exactly for that okay. reason to decide which buildings really are ones that we want to divest which ones we really want to uh, invest um, and maintain. And is that, are you doing, are you gonna look at that building by building, uh, start one, finish it, move on to the next one? Um, the study that we want to have uh, happen would include all of the buildings in uh, the portfolio, uh, both in the city and in the county. And that would be part of a report we'll bring back to explain okay. what it is. Thanks. When do you uh, when do you think that's going to be finished up? Um, it's on our work plan for okay. for this year, so maybe Q two. Well, you might want to have a look at this one at the top of the list if you have that option. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Seeing nothing further on that item, uh, Councilor McCurry, uh, C twenty LHC properties kitchen renovations. Actually, Marlene answered all my questions in her um, opening remarks. Okay. Do members wish to make any motions to add to the proposed 2022 capital program as presented? 
seeing none, do members wish to make any motions to amend the 2023 to 2031 capital forecast as presented? Okay, Joel, we're ready for an overview of step 9A. Uh, for you, Chair Martin, uh, moving on to step 9A, we uh, will be considering the 2022 Public Works uh, Commission capital budget, uh, as well as the uh, rest of the 10-year capital plan. So the Public Works capital budget uh, for 2022 is summarized on page 593 to 598 of the capital plan document. Uh, the budget uh, revised with the uh, projects that were removed earlier this evening is $122,705,631. It contains 169 projects across a number of services, including engineering, environmental services, facilities, management and security, fleet and transit services, operational services, and park services and is funded from a variety of funding sources, including development charges, gas tax, third-party contributions, rate reserves, tax-supported reserves, and debenture financing. So again, um, 593 to page 598 for the 2022 projects. Uh, Chair Martin, you can move on to 9B. Thank you. Uh, Indigit Hands, General Manager, Public Works. Please uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Chair Martin. So good evening, Chair Martin, Mayor Davis, uh, and members of council and the viewing public. I'm Indy Tines, General Manager of Public Works Commission, and I'll be presenting the PW Capital Budget for your consideration. Next slide, please. The 2022 capital budget highlights include uh, continued focus on delivering on council priorities, service review, TMP, MSP, and other master plans and guiding documents. Uh, with the development that we're expecting, PW will continue to link infrastructure expansion to those demands while ensuring that priority is placed on our existing infrastructure. As mentioned, the first night of estimates next year, the asset management priorita prioritization tool uh, will be used to build the capital budget. Finally, uh, PW will continue to apply for grants where available to help offset project costs. Uh, later in the presentation, I will provide some more detail on some of the successful grants uh, and those that are outstanding uh, that we've been uh, uh, submitting to, to other to various uh, governments, level of government. Next slide, please. So the capital budget is extensive. Um, however, I did pull a few major projects here that uh, will be moving forward uh, in the upcoming year. Uh, so we do have the police headquarters um, on and off road active transportation and trail. Uh, including this is we're looking at uh, PXOs as well. Um, we, we didn't have much of a budget last year for PXO. We know that they are very successful um, and have been implemented throughout the community. Um, so we did want to budget for that. Um, EA for the new municipal services in Northwest Brantford. Uh, the detail sheet does uh, specify a lot of those projects there. Uh, Lorne Bridge Trail realignment. Um, that's the trail that currently uh, runs underneath uh, or close to the water edge um, and realigning that a little bit higher onto the bank for safety reasons. Uh, transportation strategies, uh, regional, and, and also uh, moving forward on our city, uh, county joint strategic plans. Curbside organics, uh, the vision was, uh, or vision statement was uh, presented to committee last night. Uh, very exciting uh, news for that. Uh, Averbridge rehabilitation, THMB deck replacement, Colburn slope rehabilitation, uh, the red light camera uh, program as well. And then the Earl Ave Works Yard are, are just a few projects this year um, that, uh, that are moving forward. Next slide, please. So uh, a few key uh, projects approved from the previous budget uh, just being highlighted here for the committee and residents information um, that are well underway in the respective stages of the project. Uh, so we do have Mohawk Lake and uh, canal cleanup and rehabilitation that's moving forward. There's a few oil grid separators that were installed. Uh, Woodman pool rehabilitation, uh, moving on that design. 
uh, the water storage tank uh, to um, two through pressure district to allow for the development in the north. Uh, Dufferin Park moving along, uh, moving that project along as well, breaking some ground. Uh, Southwest Community Center and Park uh, continuing the development there as well as the uh, school library and uh, um, sorry, the school library and the community center. Uh, the downtown CCTV we went and in coordination with housing that we just heard. Uh, so along with those projects, we were very successful and secured over $1.8 million in grants uh, this past year. And we do have an, uh, an additional 11 million uh, pending decisions. Uh, some of these grants provided full funding, returning funds to the appropriate reserve, and others allowed for an increased scope so that PW could complete projects in a shorter duration or period of time. Uh, just an example of that is the uh, National Disaster Mitigation Program uh, for the waste stop valve installation, uh, where the grant helped doubled our funding, allowing for many more waste stop valves to be installed this year, earlier than our intended program. Next slide, please. So like the capital highlights, many of our future capital goals and challenges continue year over year, uh, just because of the continued growth in our city. Uh, PW will uh, continue to balance the state of good repair projects uh, with those that are required for our boundary expansion uh, areas to accommodate the growth, support growth projects identified in our MSP and TMP project uh, plans, uh, keep up to date on new involving technologies that can create efficiencies in all departments. And an example of that is our review of our onboarding equipment right now for our transit um, that will help with some of our, our uh, uh, routing and uh, on off uh, counts. Uh, maintain, operate, repair, and fund aging facilities while, while implementing strategies to provide space for, for growing departments like our operational department and providing infrastructure for all modes of transportation and balancing the needs of each. Um, I did provide a <clears throat> memo to council or the committee today uh, for the asset management plan uh, gapping. Uh, so that is with, within your package. And just one item not mentioned here, but it's very important challenge has been the response to the pandemic. Uh, projects have been impacted or delayed from the previous year because of the availability of supplies or resource shortage, uh, unable to engage in in-person with public uh, and changing regulations. PW continues to push projects forward, but uh, to ensure that the infrastructure, sorry, to ensure that the infrastructure is kept in good state of repair. Next slide, please. So this is an overview of the budget today. The numbers are slightly different, I think, from the package just because of the recent updates. Um, but it does show that there is a continued focus on our, our state of good repair um, to maintain the existing infrastructure. Next slide. I just want to end off by saying thanks to the PW leadership team and Joelle and the finance team for, for the work done in putting this budget together and on the staff on delivering these important initiatives in the upcoming year uh, for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Indy. And that brings us almost to six o'clock. So I suggest we take our dinner break now before we're starting into questions, unless somebody has a major objection to that. So we'll recess until 6.20, if that's okay with everyone. We'll see you back here at 6.20. Thank you.
Okay, 6.20, so everybody's back. Please turn your camera back on, those that have them off. Guess I should turn my camera on too. Okay, we have quorum on, on the screen. So we'll start with capital projects, uh, 9C1 through 16 which is on the first page. Are there any items people would like to separate for questions and possible amendments? Councillor Slats. Uh, 9C7, Mr. Chair. Councillor McCurry. Uh, just bear with me a second. Um, uh, number 2345. And six and seventy one. We just do on the first page, Mr. Chair. That's correct. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, the first sixteen, there's one on the next page. Any other separations? Seeing none, we'll go through them in order. 9C2, Fleet Expansion for Development Engineering, Councilor McCurry. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so this is job number 32. Um, so we are, we've previously been uh, enjoying the largesse of our staff to provide their own vehicles, is that correct? Uh, through the chair, Gary Peaver, Manager of Development Engineering. Uh, that is correct. Okay, uh, so uh, $220,000 buys what, Gary? Uh, through the chair to Councilor McCurry, that would buy uh, four uh, trucks uh, that are currently not in use uh, today uh, by staff. They either have to borrow off of uh, other departments when needed or use their personal vehicles if they can. And how often is if needed, Gary? Uh, through the chair to Councilor McCurry, uh, at this time, this is related to our water inspectors. So currently we have two water and licensed water inspectors on our group. Uh, they're starting to increase uh, as they get their levels. They're using it more and more. So right now, it's pretty much all year for one inspector. And at this time, it's starting to become almost all year for the second inspector. Okay, now um, this is going to result in a decline in... Um income for those staff because there is a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, uh, shall we say profit built into our mileage claims uh, are the are the employees uh, on side with uh, starting to use a company vehicle uh, through the chair to you counselor 100 uh, percent using the personal vehicles to try to fit some of this very large equipment in is actually starting to take a toll on their personal vehicles okay thank you very much Gary how large is the equipment that they have to put in the vehicles? Uh, through the chair to yourself, uh, typically the largest uh, piece of equipment is the water key. So typically it's four to five feet long. It's the key that reaches down to the underground valves and turns them off and on. And how many vehicles are we getting for 220,000? Through the chair, the goal is uh, four in total to match uh, the ultimate goal of having four development engineering water inspectors. Okay, do we need four right off the top? Because I thought you said there was two right now. Through the chair, uh, we don't need four uh, immediately this, uh, starting immediately this year. We only have two water inspectors currently. However, the intentions this year are to get two more water inspectors uh, on staff. Okay, and what vehicles are you getting? Uh, through the chair to yourself, they would be uh, a truck. Uh, with a larger bed, similar to the other engineering inspectors in the de design and construction group. So pickup trucks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on this item? Okay, Councilor McCurry, you have uh, fleet expansion for parks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to staff, this is a uh, an additional truck and chipper for our uh, our uh, forestry department. Um, I don't see anywhere in the documents a request for either a tree spade or a machine to do the stumping. Um, have I over, overlooked that or is that not in this year's capital?
through the chair to Councilor McCreary, that's not in this year's capital council, uh, councillor, and uh, we'll be looking at bringing forward a more comprehensive forestry uh, fleet needs over uh, as I uh, engage with the team and, and figure out what's being needed and bring uh, bring that forward through the next several cycles of budget. Yeah, that's excellent, Rick. One of our one of our biggest deficits in terms of forestry is getting those stumps dealt with in a timely fashion, uh, and that certainly would be. Um, advantageous to us to have some of those in-house and uh, you know as we're concerned about forest uh, canopy the urban forest in the city of Brantford um, there are a lot of circumstances where a tree spade could transplant trees uh, that are in the way of development and so on uh, we've tried it before with um, um, you know doing trying to do it with a backhoe we tried that years ago down at Civic Square and uh, it's just it's just completely unsuitable and um, we would be in, in good shape, uh, Rick. So if you could have a look at, at that additional equipment uh, for the coming year, please. Thank you, uh, Councillor. It, it, having equipment, but not the people or the time and the workload to actually use them is uh, kind of what I'm worried about right now, but we'll uh, make sure that we're looking at all of that going forward. Yes, the, the remainder can be looked after in your operating budget for 23, Rick. I'll hold you to it, Councillor. Any other questions on item 30, uh, 3C? Seeing none, C4, Councillor McCurry. Uh, bear with me, Mr. Chair, that's- uh, fleet, fleet expansion for, for facilities and security management. Yeah, uh, the same question that I asked previously, I don't need to do that again, thank you. The same for the next one, Mr. Chair. Okay, C5, fleet expansion for environmental services. Uh, I have a question there. Why is that uh, not being suggested for electric vehicles? Through you, Mr. Chair, Selvi Congera, Director of Environmental Services. Um, we did uh, talk to our fleet uh, staff recently. They did mention about electric uh, SUV for us. Is that what you're going to be doing there then? Um, I'll ask uh, or Shane Pepper to confirm that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Shane Pepper, uh, Fleet Manager, through the chair. Uh, I believe you're referring to the Environmental Services Expansion Vehicle. So, if if it's a my my notes had it as a compact pickup truck. So if it's a compact pickup truck, we were looking at the hybrid option. You know, as a follow up to our, our report last night, the electric trucks, they're, ju they're just not available at this time. There are some hybrid options available. Again, if electric options are available for the vehicle type that the departments are uh, procuring, then electric would be our first choice. Hybrid would be second. Okay, and the information we have, it doesn't specifically say truck. That's why I asked that. Okay, C9, Councilor McCurry, on-road active transportation initiatives. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, the job number, 71. 46. Uh, on-road transportation initiatives. Yes, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so um, it, it indicates a number of uh, things here. Uh, when it talks about construction of road bike lanes, um, does this capital project include uh, work on Dunstan Street? Good evening, Mike Abraham, Manager of Infrastructure Planning through the Chair to Councillor McQuarrie. It does not include, um, our 2022 plan does not include Dunstan. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, now, let me ask you a couple of other questions. Um, one of the things I get asked about quite frequently are, are two, two recent additions to our uh, street furniture and um, uh, signage program. There are signs that have been recently installed that talk about riding your bike to school, uh, uh, indicating the distance to ride and walk to school. Um, is that a program that's been completed? Uh, those signs have been added in as part of the wayfinding sign to give a general idea of how far you are from a destination. Um, I believe it is it is um, completed, uh, but we could always add in additional 
signs to point out destinations or major destinations. Uh, thank you, Mike. That was actually the opposite direction I was going to head. Um, I, I wonder if you might provide us with a memo uh, that outlines the origin of that program and the decision-making process and the funding for that, please, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. And similarly, Mike, we, we also have these, I guess you'd call them wayfinding signs that have sprouted up, uh, sprouted up on some city corners, and they seem designed uh, for wayfinding by pedestrians. Um, and I wonder if similarly, you could provide us with a memo about the same information regarding those. And Mike, is that one also completed, that program? That program is, is completed, yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Okay, Councillor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's just, I thought I had separated uh, C7. I just didn't want to get uh, too far past it before we come back to it. C7 was next, Councillor Sless. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I just threw you to staff. Uh, we're doing a $250,000 EA. Um, it, it's the property at the bottom of Church Street on Grand River Avenue, uh, adjacent to the river. And we're developing a park there. Is, is a quarter million dollar EA nest required uh, to build a park there? Thank you, Chair Martin. <clears throat> I think you might know it's a little bit more than me, but I, uh, Councillor Celeste, uh, there's a lot of environmental issues in that land. Uh, we did do some environmental assessment, or sorry, uh, environmental site assessment, so some of the groundwork. Uh, there was a report done previously, so um, <clears throat> this funding is to carry on with that work as well, and um, if there is a, a design aspect that we can can have for that we would uh, we would use that for, utilize that funding as well but there is some site uh, investigation that needs to be done yes I, I, well I believe the rail line caused some uh, some contamination there uh, with uh, fuel oil and oil and that type of thing uh, from diesel trains going through I, I guess my concern was that the um, at least the vision I think that the the ward councillors and I'm sure I, I'm sharing uh, Councillor Rutley's uh, vision as well is that uh, we were looking as this park is developed uh, to elevate the, uh, the topography there to bring the uh, the land at the bottom of Church Street up to the level of the dike so that when the park is completed you could sit in the park and see the river as opposed to sit in the park and look at a dike uh, and I, I think what we were looking at uh, or at least uh, our vision for this was that as, as as development is taking place in the city if we can get clearance from from uh, fill where there's construction going on and we without cost just continually fill that to bring it up to dike level um, prior to actually developing the park so that you've got a, an actual river view park um, th that was was our vision I, I don't know how that uh, folds into to the EA and, and I, I'm not sure what planning you've done at, at this stage or if there has been planning done on that park yet at this time but Th th that was the uh, the initial, I guess, thrust for, for creating this park was to actually, we don't have a park in the city where you can sit in the park and look at the river. Uh, and that was our intent was to create one here. Yes, through you, Chair Martin, that's correct. We did see the vision with Councillor Early. We were on site and uh, we, we got to explain very clearly what, what we're looking for. Um, and that resolution was to bring this forward to Council for approval uh, for the capital of it. Um, so the pretty much the design or the study, it, it, it's, it won't be as easy as just filling and then we're, we're good. There's, there's road requirements, parking lot requirements if needed. Um, how are, you know, if you fill right to the curb, you don't like, how what's the sloping? So there's a lot of land there, especially as you sliver down towards the back um, and how to utilize that uh, from the new development that's planned uh, in around just, just slightly down from there. Um, so there's some planning and, and studying that needs to be done in the area. Um, so it, it is uh, it is feasible for this project to have this funding uh, so that we can look at all those alternatives and options and, and get a design that works with the vision. Yeah, no, that's fine, Andy. I just didn't want this to get too far down the road. And then 
tell you that, um, you know, if, if you weren't contemplating it coming up to the level of the dike, that could change the whole study and, and change everything that we're doing. That I didn't want you to get down that road and then find out we got to backtrack now and, and redo things with bearing in mind that we were trying to get it up to the level of uh, a view of the river. Mm -hmm. That's that's the cause for concern. But if, if we're taking that into account, then I'm good with that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Councilor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, India, uh, is there money left in the waterfront reserve? That we've been contributing to over the years? Oh, uh, through you, Chair Martin, I have to check and get back to you on that. Uh, I'm not, I don't have that information in front of me right now. Because we've, we've also got uh, 400,000 slated for 2023 for this park. So you think this park will be able to be built for 400,000? That's the estimate, Councillor Councilor Carpenter. And, and next year, when we present the budget after this, some of the study has been done, we would have a more clear of a picture. But Generally, with the area that we have, uh, that's that's the general estimate we have in the in the twenty three. Okay, thank you. With that, that finishes this page. So we'll go now to seventeen through to thirty two. What items would people like to have separated there? Councillor Slice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like uh, 30 and 31, please. Councilor McCurry. Um, Mr. Chair, either I neglected to mention it or you overlooked it, but I would like to talk about uh, um, 9C13. Active Transportation Master Plan, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, through you to staff, um, this is a $300,000 study to tell us a lot about what we already know with respect to our uh, active transportation networks, on road, bike trails, and so on. Uh, we do have a current master plan, is that correct? We currently do not have an active transportation master plan. Okay, is, sorry, uh, let me rephrase, um, Jen. Um, did we not recognize active transportation in our transportation master plan? Correct, through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, you are correct. There was an active transportation component within the transportation master plan. This is to look at the entire city holistically, um, tie in the Northern expansion lands as well as the Tootla Height area and come up with on-road and off-road active transportation. Um, we do have dedicated staff, correct, that look after our active transportation. Through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, we do currently have a senior project manager for active transportation on staff. Uh, Jen, I'd like to see us uh, kick this down the road or, or simply punt it. Um, I look at $300,000 and that'll buy an awful lot of stuff. It'll buy a lot of pavement markings. It'll buy a lot of asphalt paving. Um, and I, you know, I, I appreciate the intent of doing this to have a, a, an overall look, but gosh, I just, I just can't see spending that money on a plan when we have so many deficits actually in, in our, our active transportation system. So, Mr. Chair, I'm going to uh, move a, a, an amendment to this, I guess. I appreciate, I appreciate why staff want to do it, but gosh, I'd rather see us spend the money on stuff rather than talking about stuff. Mm -hmm. Might, might I add through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, um, I do hear you. It is just to, to advise, it is a guidance document that can be used for all of the development of the North expansion lands. It is you, also Jim. fully funded, I believe, through development okay. charges, yes. Before we go any further, do we have a seconder for the motion? Uh, the, motion would be to, the motion would be to defer this to uh, 2024. Councillor Van Tilburg is willing to second that. Thank you. Um, can you comment on uh, the concept of doing this in-house instead of spending 300,000 on a consultant? Through you to you, uh, Chair Martin. 
Um, there are expertises that could be found from a consultant engineering firm in order to look at the entire city. It is a large undertaking for one staff member. Okay, Councillor Sicoli. Yes, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, could you elaborate? I see further on down item or reference number 78, the transportation master plan review and update. Can you just explain to me how that item is different than the item that we're talking about? And specifically what might be missing from that master plan that would have been information that would have been given to you through this this process? Through, through the chair to you, Councillor Sicoli. I'm so I apologize. Can you remind me of the item, line item that you're questioning? Um, so we're looking at number 71 currently. Yes. But number 78 is a transportation master plan review and update. What would be the difference between those two plans? Uh, through the chair, um, Mike Abraham, Manager of Infrastructure Planning. The difference between those two studies is the TMP looks at active transportation at you know a fifty thousand foot ceiling. We would want to bring that down to more of a reasonable level. Uh, the point of the asset management, um, sorry, not the asset management, the active transportation uh, master plan is to develop strategies and actions um, that we can put towards guiding our capital works operations and maintenance. We would want to develop certain standards uh, for safety, trail connections, servicing bike lanes, uh, such as for um, winter maintenance. Um, those would be the biggest difference. It's basically a, a much more detailed study. Okay. So if you had to pick one of these as more important, which one would it be? So through you, Count, uh, Chair Martin, to Councillor Sikoli, they're two completely different projects. One is a transportation master plan. This, this deals with the overall transportation network roads. Uh, how we move people, uh, rather buses, any type mode of transportation. And it feeds into our, obviously how we create our DCs. Um, the active transportation, sorry, the, yes, yeah, the active transportation is delving down into just one component of a transportation master plan. Um, so staff are, are, are not being straight with it, but we are not being successful with the public in terms of getting the active transportation bike lane message out. But many of the projects that we bring out are being canceled or put off because there's no understanding and there's no guiding document looking at this network across how we're on road and off road and where we're connecting. It's becoming piecemeal right now. And so the idea right now is that we have this guiding document uh, for our active transportation, solely for our active transportation, uh, that we can then go back to the public and make and have them understand what the overall vision is at a level closer to the communities. Um, this is so if we refer to the transportation master plan and we did go out for the, the to the public for the whole master plan, active transportation was a component, as I mentioned before. So it may have been missed by the public. This is solely based on our bike network, and that's why there's an importance to get this project on. You're crystal clear. Thank you so much for explaining that. Okay, Mayor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I can certainly sympathize with that. We've seen uh, ad hoc piecemeal changes in our active transportation plan. In other words, the bike network in the city. But what really caught my attention, Jennifer, was when you said boundary lands, and I can see there's a tremendous potential in the boundary lands for off-road bike trails. There's a huge green space up there and having a really good bike trail network up there is gonna be a large part of the quality of life that uh, people will have out there as people in the sheltered lane area often refer to the, the benefit of the trails that are in their area. So tell me, how essential is it that uh, we have that plan? Like, wouldn't it be picked up to the block plan? 
the block planning process or if someone fully understand what it'll bring to the uh, a very uh, astute development of the boundary lands and the plan for that. Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, you are correct. The active transportation master plan would be a holistic city approach that would be a guiding document into the block plan process. It gives public works and planning more um, um, meat or pull in order to gear the active transportation on-road and off-road in the northern expansion lands. Okay, what is it going to say? It's going to say, well, we need to have some trails up here. Or is it going to actually set out sort of a concept of where they might be? You are correct. It will set out a concept of where they should be, where connector paths will be in which to feed that area. So how do you do that if you haven't had the block plan, you know where your parks are going to be? Like, is, which one is the cart? Which one is the horse? Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, the transportation master plan is the guiding document into the block plan process, which identifies where we should require arterial roads, collector roads, residential roads, and the active transportation master plan will tie in through that and, and identify the um, on-road and off-road active transportation routes. All right, so it's the policy of this council to, to move forward with the boundary land planning and assessment process. So what does it do to, if we pump this or kick it a year, two years? What's the downside to that in the, in the context of the boundary land? Mm -hmm. Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, it will create um, a, a, a bottleneck and some more effort for um, the planning department and public works in order to get those trails and those connecting pieces in place in the block plan process. Mr. Chair, final comment. I appreciate Councilor McCreary's sentiment. I can't support it. Uh, how many times have we made this mistake in the past uh, in uh, when developing and bringing new areas and not having complete planning? And it's gonna be a major aspect of the quality of life in that area. Let's do it right. And uh, let's do it in a timely fashion. So I'm gonna, I will not vote in favor of this. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Antosky. Thank you, Chair Martin. Um, just looking to confirm one more clarification between the two plans. As, as I understand it, the master transfer, the trans transportation master plan is an existing document that these funds are really the review, the update, do we need to, you know, um, create anything new or add to it? And what we're, when we're talking about the active transportation master plan, this is new. Uh, you know, it's it as a standalone document, so much more fulsome. Is this something that you know other cities are doing and spending a lot of attention on and, and making a priority? Through the chair to you, Councillor Antoski. Yes, other municipalities have completed their active transportation master plan. We would be using, um, I believe, the city of Kitchener as a template in which to push out our active transportation plan. And so why do we think that active transportation has become so much more important? I mean, it's something that we've obviously peripherally paid attention to. Um, what has changed demographically that this has now become something that we really need to be paying attention to? Through the chair to you, Councillor Antoski, um, a big um, item that has brought active transportation into the forefront is our COVID pandemic, where many residents have been confined to their homes and they have been utilizing active transportation much more in order to get their exercise. Okay, and, and previous to, to COVID, is, are we seeing it as more of a, um, not necessarily a generation, but just a change in, in cultural activity and physical activity. Are we, are we just, and, and does some of, does any of that have to do with people moving from other communities? Is it changing what we're looking for in our community? Sorry, I know these are hard to answer there. Sorry. That is okay. Um, through the chair to you, Councillor Antoski, you are correct. We are seeing an influx of residents coming into Brantford from other municipalities that do have um, quite a robust active transportation um, master plan, say from Toronto, Brampton area. So we are trying to, um, to do those to get that active transportation in place to provide to our residents. 
Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Welcome. Councilor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jennifer, when we talk about uh, doing the study and then having the study in place, we know that the land, the north, land, the north lands coming north of Parliament Road, will be coming on stream shortly. And if we don't have the plan in place, then who's going to pay for the infrastructure when it comes to doing it later? Uh, and and could you correct me if I'm wrong, but does the developer that's developing those areas under block plan have to build the infrastructure that we put in place because of the study? Mm -hmm. Through the chair to you, Councillor Carpenter, you are 100% correct. If we have the uh, master plan in place and we can put into the block plans and to the developers, those will be funded through development charges and through and the developer built. And if it's not, and we want to put uh, that act of transportation in there later, we'll have to pay for that at uh, the taxpayer. Correct. We would have to input, input that into the capital plan in order to build that after the fact, um, and we would be dealing with established neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. And with that, I won't be supporting the amendment either. Councillor Wall. Is there any compromise here? Like, if, if we're talking about kicking this down the road for two years, is it possible for us to put into place a plan to deal with the boundary land stuff that needs to be done now at, like, a portion of this cost and then the, the, do the remainder of it next year? Like, could we split this 300 in the two 150s over the course, like half this year and half next year without it doing significant damage to the plan? Through the chair to you, Councillor Wall, it is more beneficial to look at the entire city holistically so that you can look at the existing connections that are coming out and in which to tie into. So it's not feasible to do half now, half later. You may result in additional charges. It is more economical to do the entire city as opposed to doing it piecemeal. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Councilor McCurry. Uh, Jen, what's the year for the TMP? Through the chair to you, Councilor McCreary, the five-year update for the transportation master plan, the 450,000 is sitting, I believe in 2026. Okay, so, um, is it safe to assume that the same type of consultant would be doing, would be bidding on both of these projects? Through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, it is possible that we would see similar um, consulting engineering firms, but we also may see a broader range of firms that are, are um, more experienced in active transportation applying for this. Where so do we, do we currently have a transportation master plan for the north of power line? Sorry, for the annex? Through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary. Yes, the current transportation master plan did include the, um, the annexed lands as well as Tutla Heights. Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, I can see that this is going nowhere. Um, I, uh, I will remind folks of the phrase infrastructure deficit, however, thank you. And I'll, I'll just withdraw it, Mr. Chair. That'll save us a few minutes. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Okay, so items 17 to 32. We have 30 and 31 separated now, I believe. Yes, any others that need to be separated? Councilor Ventilberg. 23. Any others? Okay, Councillor Van Tilburg, 23 will be the first one. Airport Extend Building 70T Hangar. Okay, could somebody in detail tell me what are we trying to achieve with extending the airport hangar? Good afternoon, Rick Cox, Director of Park Services. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, through the Chair, Councillor Van Tilburg, we have a aircraft hangar that we currently um, rent out sections to tenants for, to store their planes. It is uh, one, one of the buildings is not the same size as the others. It was uh, built uh, shorter than the rest. And this project would be to extend the length of that building to match the rest of the other T hangers in that area. And also to build the new uh, I'm going to use the wrong word, but the new cubby holes, the new the new hangers uh, in in that section, 
at a slightly larger size to accommodate uh, taller and wider aircraft. So the effect would be to have the building length match the other T hangers, but the building height be slightly taller and the number of T hangers uh, a little bit fewer per square foot so that we can accommodate some of the larger planes that we're uh, getting requests for. This would be completed this year? Um, I, I would expect that the design and the uh, foundational work, the, the land work would be completed this year with the construction uh, started. I'm not sure if it would be completely finished by the end of 2022. And that can be done for 350. Um, there, we understand that this uh, section <laughs> could be done for that amount, along with the other infrastructure pieces that are already approved in the airport master plan. Okay, and what, ha what happens if it's going to cost us more? We will have to have that discussion with the financial team. This is a revenue generating uh, yes. building so that uh, if there is additional financing that's required uh, finance through debt, we may be able to use uh, revenue from the tenants to support that extra cost. And, and these changes, how much extra revenue do we anticipate? The reason why we're doing it, in fact, how much, what, what are we expecting to get out of it? Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Van Tilburg, I'll have to get that back to you, but uh, we rent uh, the hangers for approximately $500 a month, uh, and these would be larger hangers, so we'd be looking at a, a slightly, slightly larger size and price tag. Thank you. Councillor Carpenter. Yeah, and to the Director of Parks. Uh, and this, uh, this is funded strictly out of the capital reserve that is developed, that's contributed from the airport itself. Is that not correct? Yes, that's correct. So it's self-funding. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, a T hanger that was built years ago that was shorter because they were oversized. There wasn't the demand for uh, a full row of oversized T hangers. Now there's the demand for it. So we're extending that T hanger row to accommodate additional aircraft. Seeing nothing further on this, we'll go to item C30, Councillor Schles. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. It, I guess it relates to C30. It's not actually C30. C30 is the uh, master plan for the cemeteries, but uh, my concern, and I, I couldn't find it anywhere in the budget or in the capital, and I, I would hope it would be somewhere in there, and I haven't found it, but in Mount Hope Cemetery, the uh, the road network in there is, is deplorable. Um, it, it's it's full of potholes. It, it I don't know how a hearse drives through it and doesn't have problems because it, uh, it it's not in very good shape at all. And my understanding of, of the uh, Cemetery Act is that when you purchase your plot in, in a cemetery, th there's a certain portion of that money goes into a fund that, that's self-perpetuating to maintain a standard within that facility. And uh, I would dare say we're, we're not hitting any type of standard on the road, the roadway network. Um, if somebody from cemeteries could comment, uh, and if there is a plan, or if I've missed it in, in capital, I, I would hope I have, but if I haven't, um, how do we go about doing? Through the chair, Rick Cox, director of parks, uh, Councillor Sless, that the cemetery master plan would indeed outline how we might proceed with develop, uh, redeveloping and shoring up our road network in the entire cemetery system over the next period of time. That's what the cemetery master plan will assist us with. I do believe you are correct. There is nothing in the current uh, capital program related to improving the roads uh, in the cemeteries. However, hopefully we can address some of that through our operational budgets and we'll look at bringing back some uh, a, a fully fleshed out plan for that uh, through the next budget cycle. Yeah, that'd be much appreciated. Thanks a lot, Rick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anybody else on this item? Councillor Utley, your Thank hand's you, hard Mr. to see Chair. with that background. Yeah, it's uh, that's a tough. If I had a, a darker hand there, it might uh, might work better. But uh, anyhow, um, my my question is along the same lines as Councillor Sless uh, in a Greenwood uh, Cemetery, which is which is pretty old. Um, I, I understand that the water system um, is not in very good repair, if at all. And um, a friend of mine has a husband that's resting at uh, Greenwood, and um, she's 
too old and frail right now to carry water from the one tap all the way to um, uh, water her, her husband's grave. And I wonder if that can be included in the in the uh, master plan uh, that to take a look at the water system and make it more convenient for um, those visiting their, their loved ones to have water that's uh, easily accessible. Thank you. If I could get a real response to that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd appreciate it. Through the chair, uh, Councillor Adley, I'll make sure that that's considered in the master plan. Should it get approved? Uh, should it get approved tonight? Thank you very much, Councillor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, uh, Rick. Um, are you aware whether or not the repairs to the little mausoleum at Greenwood have been completed, or is that going to end up in the master plan? Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to Councillor McCreary, I will have to check on that. I know there is some mausoleum work that is being uh, uh, that is currently underway, but I believe it's the larger mausoleum at Oak Park. So uh, I'll have to check on the Greenwood mausoleum. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, Rick, uh, there was a, I believe it was a roof replacement that was, I thought was scheduled for the tail end of 21. And could you also update us on, uh, in, in a memo, on the, um, the uh, status of the major work that's been undertaken at the, um, the uh, Mount Hope Mausoleum as well, okay? Seeing nothing further on this item, Councillor Sluss, you had... Uh... C31, Ava Road and Palmerston Street yeah. configuration. Sorry, I, I missed one question on the last item, if I could, uh, Mr. Chair, with your indulgence. Yep. Okay. It was just um, while we're looking at this master plan, Rick, I, I get calls from folks that uh, in a number of areas in, in Mount Hope Cemetery, people have planted shrubs and they planted them years ago. And, and now those folks have probably passed on and there's no one left to maintain things. They grow to the point where they, they totally obscure the, uh, the, the stone that is there. And driving through a number of them are, are dead. Um, th they should be removed. It's kind of unsightly. If you drive through and have a look, especially as you enter off Turing Cross, if you turn to the left, that first section there is full of, of huge shrubs that uh, dwarf and hide the, uh, the stones. So if somebody could have a look at that, it's a matter of trying to find who owns that and, and have them come in and fix it. And if there is no uh, living relative, then it, I, I guess it would be incumbent on the city to uh, to have a look at that. But it uh, it certainly needs attention. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Sless, uh, thank you. We'll make sure that we're taking a look at that uh, over the next period of time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, Councillor Sless, I had a complaint about the, the exact same problem, and uh, when I in indicated to staff the area, they they removed the shrubs. So. Councillor Carpenter, you're next. Or that those previous comments should be covered under the care and maintenance. Uh, just a question to staff on, on well, uh, we got a policy that uh, stones, uh, headstones can't have any writing on the back. Even if it's got an initial on the back, it doesn't qualify and can't be placed there. Could we have that reviewed and, and uh, a reasonable explanation why we can't have any writing on the back of a stone? Thank you. It's part of the plan. Through uh, the chair, yes, Councillor Carpenter, we'll take a look at that through the master plan review. Okay, Councillor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, I was remiss in not separating an item of concern for you and I, which is, um, I believe it's number 21, the uh, King George Road water main project. Sorry, what number was that, 21? I believe it's number 21. It's job number 102. Okay. Um, so with your leave, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question of staff. Um, was there any further discussion on uh, the for, cemetery's master plan first? Seeing none. Okay, Mr. Councilor McCurry, go ahead with 21. Sorry, Chair. Thank you. Uh, through you to staff, um, This is this a water main running from, um, from I guess, Charing Cross Street to the former county of Brant lands. Could you, could you, Jennifer, could you tell us the start and finish points? 
Of course, through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, I do apologize. I'm just pulling up that detail sheet, but I believe that that is the project that was identified through the master servicing plan, and it is the servicing to the um, future um, pressure district 2-3 uh, uh, water storage facility. Okay, but where, where does it, where does the work commence, Jennifer? So, yep, yeah, through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, this is being looked at currently in the um, environmental assessment for the new elevated water storage facility. Um, at this time, that will be flushed through with the preliminary design of that tower. But at this point in time, we believe that it has come from Tollgate Pumping Station and traveling up um, down Tollgate Road, cross the 403 and up King George Road. Okay, um, so with respect to the pre-engineering, um, this is gonna involve a complete excavation of King George Road, is that correct? <clears throat> through the chair to you, Councilor McCreary, through preliminary design and detailed design, we will look at um, how to install that if trenchless technology makes more sense as to be open cut because we have open cut that road. Um, at least once in the last five to 10 years. And yeah. we have done some resurfacing up on the Northern portion of King George Road. Now, Jennifer, were you around when we did the trenchless work on uh, uh, Dunstan Street from, I can't remember the start and finish points? Yes, through the chair to you, Councilor McCurry, I was here and I do remember that project quite vividly. And we're, we're sharing the same facial expression, I believe, are we not? That was a different situation and I, okay. I do not want to make excuses. However, that was more of a residential um, yeah. with a lot of tie-ins where this one would just be dedicated line up to the new tower. And you know what, the, that project was on, on balance. It was pretty good, um, all things considered. Okay, so um, there'll be some consultation with the businesses as well. Um, we had some difficulties with St. Paul Avenue and. Um, you know, this is our prime commercial strip commercial uh, street in the city and um, Councillor Martin and I would be very grateful if you could relieve of us of a lot of those phone calls by some pre planning. Mm -hmm. Through the chair to you Councillor McCreary you are correct. Um, public consultation is very high priority to us at this time. So yes, we will be looking into that. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome. And now for the other side of King George Road where to Councillor Sluss. Yes, thank you. Yeah, this side of the of the tracks also has concerns. Uh, Jen, my, my my biggest concern is we're decommissioning the the existing water tower at the 403 and King George Road uh, once this new one is built. And I, I believe we're going through the process of identifying the the ideal location for a new uh, water tower. Um, can I be safe in assuming that the, the new locations that are being considered would be part of the uh, the expansion lands not currently uh, developed. Like we're not going to try and transplant this tank into a uh, an existing neighborhood, are we? It's going into uh, open field. Is that is that fair? That, that that's where you're looking. Through the chair to you, Councillor Sless. Yes, um, we have shortlisted a few sites for the um, water storage facility, um, and it is ideal to be placed into um, a undeveloped area. Okay. Are you at liberty to say where you're looking right now? Or is that compromising anything? I would defer to the Director of Environmental Services for that, Selvi Congera. I do know the sites, um, but we are still very early in the EA stages. Um, Selvi Congera, Director of Environmental Services. Uh, thank you, Jen. Um, uh, Councillor Sless, that is right. We are looking at uh, some greenfield properties um, uh, north of Powerline Road, um, uh, east or west side of King George Road. Okay, thank you. That, that was very specific. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Councillor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Jen, one, one more question. We do have some... Um, telecom stuff on top of the uh, current water tower. Um, and that water tower really is a Brantford icon and um, a part of our heritage. So is the structure itself planned for retention? Through the chair to you, Councillor McCreary, it is a beautiful landmark for the city. Um, 
we will look into it with decommissioning. However, if it were to remain, um, it does then still require upgrades in which to like, so it doesn't um, degrade um, and pro pro pose a safety hazard. Um, in regards to the telecommunications and such that we do have on top of the King George Road, um, the elevated water tank on King George Road, um, we will be looking to um, potentially relocate that to the new tower. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome. And has that been investigated as to whether the new location will, will satisfy the needs of the equipment that's there? Through you to you, Councillor Martin. Um, that will be flushed out through in the the uh, preliminary design and the detailed design, but we will be engaging all of the stakeholders um, in that. It will also have a potential um, if towers are needed for um, um, water meters. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, C31, Ava and Palmerston Ave, Councillor Schles. Thank uh, you. Chair Martin, you missed Councillor Carpenter. Sorry, Councilor Carpenter, your hand's hard to see in the background. Uh, yeah, uh, just a quick question that sparked. Jennifer, if, we're, if we do maintain the old tower, which I would support, uh, is there, does it then become an opportunity then to find uh, new space for rental new telecommunication equipment that could be rented by other organizations? New revenue generating? Through the chair to you, Councillor Carpenter, um, it is a possibility to, to look into it and engage. Um, all of the stakeholders that are either on that current tower or are looking for placement. Um, when we do design the um, elevated water storage tanks, if it is elevated, um, we do design it to um, accommodate any future. Um, okay, so there may be an opportunity to uh, rent further space out there when we remove that to actually do a maintenance program. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. Okay, Councillor Schles. Yes, this was regarding uh, Ada and uh, Palmerston Avenue, the uh, the cutoff off of Brent Ave. And I, I guess my first question to, uh, I guess we'll go through to Indy or to Jen, I'm not sure which. Um, it appears that we're going to do the study and design uh, in 2022 and we'll do the physical uh, build in 23. Through the chair to you, Councillor Schles, that is correct. Okay. Uh, what we've got there now is effective uh, in, in blocking traffic and keeping things out, but it, it certainly is unsightly. Uh, it is, that is going to be there for the next uh, year and a half. Uh, is, is there anything we can do to mitigate that starkness as, as you drive down? It, it, it looks like a construction site or something, which I guess ultimately it will be, but currently it, it's just part of a, a residential street and it, uh, it's a little rough to be quite candid. Uh, I haven't had complaints, but after uh, I think a year or so of sitting there, we're probably going to start getting complaints. And I, I just wonder, is there is there anything that can be done there that, that would uh, maybe mitigate some of that, uh, that, that just rough terrain that, that's there now? Through the chair to you, Councillor Sless, um, the, the Jersey barriers are a, a semi-permanent um, condition with some of the concerns that we've been having with um, residents even driving over boulevards. It is a more ideal solution as opposed to um, pylons or anything more decorative, if I could use that word. Yeah, no, I, I just wondered, you know, anything from, uh, you know, so, some planting, uh, you know, pots that sit on top of these big chunks of cement, something to just take away that uh, almost deserted look. Uh, it's just, it's not very appealing. It, mm -hmm. and, and it wouldn't concern me, uh, but it's going to be there for an extended period of time. It, it's not, it's, it's nothing, you know, it's almost, it's semi-permanent. So if, if there's something we can do to have a look at that while we get the design work done and, and get ready to do the construction, uh, I don't know whether, you know, a discussion with parks or something uh, that, that could just mitigate that, that look would be appreciated. Yes, through you, Chair Martin. Uh, Council Chester, on the same mindset as me, I was thinking about planters on the property side, um, possibly. Uh, so I'll, I'll have our directors engage with each other and uh, see what we can do. That'd be appreciated. Thanks, Indy. And thanks, Jen. Being no one else on this item, 
We'll go next to the next section, 33 to 49. Mayor Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got four, beginning with 34, 38, 41, 43. Thirty-four, thirty-eight, forty-one, forty-three. Yes. Okay, Councilor Atley. Thirty-five, please. And Councilor McCurry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Number thirty-six, thirty-seven, forty-three, and forty-four. Any others? Seeing none, the first one is thirty-four. Red light camera software purchase and site preparation. Mayor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to staff, in terms of this red light uh, program, what can we expect to see this year? I realize the, the detail sheet says we're purchasing some equipment and what's, what exactly is gonna happen this year? Uh, through the chair, uh, Mark Jacklin, Director of Operational Services to the Mayor. Uh, through this year, what we'll be looking at is obviously uh, getting, uh, we have an unmet need that needs to go through. Uh, we also have to get permission from the province. Uh, we also have to get permission and there's contracts that would need to be signed in order for us to get this up by the end of the year. Uh, we'd also have to look at, that's what some of this red, uh, red light camera uh, capital funding's for in order to get the site preparation uh, in order so that we can get this up hopefully by the end of the year. Great. So, so that's the vision before the end of the year. So sure, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Councilor Van Tilburg. There we go. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Mark, what site preparation? So through the chair, in order for the tickets, so in, in the event that somebody challenges a ticket, we have to ensure that all the site was done properly. So we have to have proper pavement markings, uh, proper signage. Uh, we have to ensure there's no trees covering any of the areas. Um, so there's just a lot of work that needs to go into it just to ensure that the area is actually uh, constructed properly. So what, what location are you pointing at? We had a few on a, a list. And I'm wondering, what do you, are you talking of a specific location uh, when, when you say site preparation? So through the chair, once the, uh, there was some preliminary sites that were picked, uh, but we'd actually have to work uh, with the, uh, the uh, contract that we picked the camera from in order to get the sites uh, to determine which well, sites. I'm we thinking use. Deleuze and Clarence, because that has all the accidents. That's correct. That was one of the sites that has been chosen, uh, but there's a lot of things that need to go into that to, in order to, so we still have to work with the consultant uh, uh, and the actual, uh, the company who owns the, the cameras that we get our um, um, contracts with in order now to- we, ensure have, we have an unmet need. Can we not tie this to the unmet need? Because one without the other is kind of doesn't make sense uh, monetarily. In other words, we'd be putting 60 cow out and be sitting around waiting for something else to happen. So through the chair, this is just the capital money in order to get the sites and everything prepared. The actual unmet need is coming through through the operating budget. On the operating budget. Right. Okay. And what if that doesn't come through? Through the chair, that will just constrain us to how uh, soon we're able to actually get this program up and off the. Yeah, so we certainly don't go forward with this unless we fully intend to go forward with the other. Would be the the wisest choice of our money used properly. Would you agree? Through the chair, that would be uh, that's the intention. All right, and uh, and we're really going to consider Clarence and Deleuze as a prime location. <laughs> Through the chair, that was one of the selected. It uh, has sites. a lot of accidents. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions on this item, we'll go to C35, Councillor Atley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff, I just want to clarify the pre-location of the lawn bowling. 
um, is it going to the Wayne Gretzky Sports Center or the Walter Gretzky Golf Course? Through, through you, Chair Martin, good catch, Councilor. That's a that's an error. It should be what Walter okay. Gretzky Golf Center. I was hoping that that yes. it was an error. So uh, okay, thanks very much. Yeah. Oh, and uh, one other, when uh, when is work expected to start on the tennis courts? Uh, so through you, uh, Chair Martin, we're we're right now we're working on that detailed design. So we should be seeing some soil movement this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilor McCurry, C35, sorry, C36, trail safety uh, improvements. Yes, so thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, much appreciative of staff's efforts to um, to deal with some of the issues on our trails. Uh, with your uh, indulgence, Mr. Chair, I, I would like to uh, return to this at the end of our uh, question period to um, try to move some of the money forward. Thank you. Actually, you might as well do that now. Um, this is for questions and uh, amendments. Okie doke. Well, what I would like to do, uh, so what you see before you is $200,000 a year from 2022 to 2031. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what I would like to do is uh, to increase the annual allocation to $300,000 a year uh, from now until 2028. And then we would uh, scrap 2029, 2030, and 2031 which would spread the same amount of money over a shorter period of time. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Wall, thank you. Any comments on this amendment? Councillor Carpenter. Yes, could staff tell us where the money would come from? The 100,000? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we do anticipate that we could still fund this through the capital funding envelope, just the same amount of money along a different payment schedule. Um, I can say with confidence for sure it's not impacting 2022 or 2023. And if there is any further impacts beyond that, we would bring that back to either the Finance Committee or the Estimates Committee to identify something different. So it won't affect the taxpayer. Correct. Thank you. Okay, there had been another hand, but I see it down. Uh, our trails do need some some safety improvements. There are some uh, significant areas that are, are quite dangerous, and hopefully this will resolve the worst of them to start with and, and deal with all of them a little quicker. So with that, we'll call the question on the amendment. Oh, Councillor Wall, you reaching for your hand? Go ahead. My mouse isn't working, I'm sorry. Um, so anybody at home watching this budget process, I can't even imagine. Um, especially considering it's all via Zoom and, and, and what's going on here. But this is the kind of creative stuff I like to see. Uh, this is taking like exactly what Councilman Curry said, the same amount of money and just doing something different with it. And it might not seem like a lot, but I think it is going to make a difference this year, which is what the intention of the motion is. So I hope that everyone can support, specifically because this isn't going to impact the budget. Like it is, but it isn't. Not, you know, like Councilor Carbon said, it's not going to impact the taxpayer. And with that lead in, we'll call the question. And if eScribe's working, we'll have the vote soon. Yeah, just waiting on Councillor Utley. Against, and Mayor Davis. Sorry. Yes, yes, four. Yes. So the amendment uh, carries on a recorded vote of eight to two. Those in favor, Mayor Davis, Councillor Sokoli, Sless, McCurry, Martin Carpenter, and Toski. Wall, those against, Councillors Van Tilborg and Utley. Seeing nothing further on that item, we'll move to C37, Trail Maintenance and Repairs, Councillor McCurry. A chair, thank you through you to staff. Indy, um, I don't see mention of crack filling uh, with respect to our asphalt uh, trails here. Is that something that you consider to be operational or uh, capital? 
through you, Chair Martin. Uh, Councilor Mercury, that would be operational. Last year, we did add 50,000 to have some crack areas crack sealed. Uh, <clears throat> honestly, it didn't go too far because of our trail conditions, um, but that would be in the operational. Yeah, that's super, Andy. It's, it's nice to see that we are maintaining that which we build. We've had uh, so many sections of trail that have been deteriorated because we haven't really maintained after installation. So thank you. Councilor Carpenter. Thank you. Uh, Indy, on the same line, and we are paving more trails in this budget. So as we pave more trails, um, are, are we in also increasing the operating budget to maintain maintenance of them? So <clears throat> there's, there's generally an offset. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into unpaved trails as well. Um, and clearing of, of our paved trails is a lot easier as well, keeping them open and uh, for the, the winter season. So um, I don't have the details in terms of the offset comparing both, um, but uh, there is a lot of lot of ruts and whatnot in the unpaved trails that we're seeing. So one may offset the other, but you're going to provide that to us. Okay, thank you. If you like, so, yeah, if you like that, I, would, I can. Yeah, I can I'd like that. to see the comparison because, you know, we're paving trails and we have roads that need maintained. Thank you. Okay, seeing nothing further. Mayor Davis, C-38, River Access Boat Launch. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so that current boat access, such as it is pretty rough. Um, and then, of course, we have the river access below Cockshut Bridge. And I'm wondering, I'm trying to envision what is this going to look like? What are we going to see after we spend $385,000 here? What is it going to look like? Will it look like the same as similar to... <clears throat> what we see at the cockpit, uh, or is it going to be something different than that? Mayor Davis, Rick Cox, Director of Park Services. I'm going to need to get back to you on the design of that, uh, how they compare. To be honest, Mayor Davis, I'm not sure if we're ready to be able to tell you, <clears throat> part of me, uh, the exact differences, but we'll get that information to you uh, prior to the next meeting. Yeah, well, in particular, in the Coxshire, you have a paved parking lot, and then I believe you have uh, sort of a concrete ramp down to the river, whereas Dobney Creek right now is just basically the, the floodplain and pretty rocky and a sloped area that runs into the river. So just, just trying to understand if you can, please. I don't need the detailed design parameters, but uh, what the overall design parameters are going to be. Um, through, you, uh, through the chair to you, Mayor Davis, one of the main objectives of this will be to try and um, uh, make it much more difficult for uh, vehicles to get into the river uh, in a way that uh, they uh, currently do. Uh, by establishing, as you said, a concrete pad with a drop off uh, that would make it more difficult for um, for folks to damage the riverbed by uh, leaving the boat uh, boat launch area on in a vehicle that we don't want in that part of the river. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I've seen uh, a large SUV stuck in the middle of the river. Um, <clears throat> yeah, not very intelligent to drive your car in the middle of the river, but uh, you can easily do it from Dobney Creek. So I'm glad to hear that's going to be incorporated. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, Councillor Antosky. Thanks, Chair. Just want to quickly highlight since um, this group is, is a group that we talked about last night, this is another. Um, project that Brant Waterways Foundation has partnered with the city and, and has agreed to put $100,000 towards over the past, the next, I think it's five years. Um, so, so that's a great community partnership and um, it certainly helps our, our budget. Okay, I have a question, Rick. The, the river's fairly shallow there. What, uh, what size boat can, can even be launched there safely? Through you, uh, Councillor, or through the chair to the chair, um, I would suspect you're correct that uh, in most of the time you're not going to be launching very, um, you know, large boats there. It's mostly for canoes and, and smaller smaller boats. But the issue that we're seeing there really is related to uh, vehicle control rather than um, boat a larger boat launch. And this would be not necessarily to enable larger boats, uh, but to make the um, 
the surface of the ramp more durable and more resilient. And then also as, uh, as indicated before, some level of drop off on the far end so that uh, going off it in a vehicle would be um, not something folks would regularly choose to do. They might do it once. Okay, Mary Davis. I know that river, part of the river really well, having fly fished it many times. You really don't take a, a, bo a bigger boat beyond the Cockshed Bridge. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna beach it or run into rapids, and uh, so I don't think we'll have a problem with trying to put <laughs> motor boats in through Dobney Creek. But then again, maybe someone might try it. But will there be a pretty clear indication then that uh, what it's designed for? Because you're doing if you're doing canoes and kayaks and that sort of thing, uh, Rick, it's a different kind of ramp. Yes, that's correct, uh, Mayor Davis. The, de the the design of that whole place will. Uh, is intended, as I understand it, to include um, informational signage and interpretive signage, and sort of be a more of a, a, a natural, a natural uh, boat launch. Uh, but also to try and put some uh, put some control to the vehicle. So uh, it is uh, not intended to facilitate large vehicles, and that would be clear as you arrive that that's not something you're going to want to try and do. Yeah, great. Thanks. Seeing nothing further on this item, C41, Gypsy Moth Control, Mayor Davis. Yeah, Gypsy Moth Control. After our experience last summer, I'm very pleased to see this in here. Uh, but if staff could tell us where will the moth control be done? What will the, the type of moth control be? And will it be confined solely to our parks? I assume you've got Mohawk Park in this and uh, probably some other areas. And so anyways, if you can just des briefly describe what the program is going to look like. And lastly, why is it in capital? Why wouldn't it be in operating? So sorry, threw a lot of questions at staff on that one. But Thank you very much, Mayor. And I'm just pulling up. I, I expected this uh, conversation, so I actually uh, prepared to answer it. Um, the I just have to pull up the, the file. The, uh, So uh, what we are planning for, and Vicky uh, is on the line, I believe, and, and can step in if I miss something. But last year, the, uh, the control strategies include the burlap wraps in heavy areas and removal, manual removal of the, of the egg masses, as well as some pheromone traps. Uh, what we're going to do uh, this year is actually incorporate an aerial spray uh, component uh, specifically to the areas that were heavily impacted, Mohawk Park, Mount Hope Cemetery, Wyndham Hills neighborhood and Glenhurst Gardens. Uh, they're all also um, going to be doing some other, uh, or sorry, the, the aerial piece is, is proposed for city owned properties with the exception of the Wyndham Hills neighborhood. So we are going to be doing some public consultation around that in February and March prior to implementing area, any aerial spring and uh, distributing some information to the neighborhood around that. Uh, we will probably also see some of the burlap wraps and, and egg mass um, treatments as well, but the, the bulk of the change this year will be to incorporate aerial spraying into the program so we can affect a larger area a little bit more cost effectively. And we're also looking at uh, working with our neighboring municipalities and, uh, and large property owners to um, do some bulk buying of the services and hopefully achieve some savings and, and thereby impact the larger area. So why is it up? Why is it capital? Why wouldn't it be operating? I mean, I don't have a problem with you putting on capital, but just kind of seems like it'd be operating not capital. Honestly, Mayor Davis, through the chair, I'm not sure why that decision was made, but uh, I can find out and get back to you. Well, look, I don't have a problem with you. If you're going to access some gas tax money, is that the is that the intent? So through the Chair Martin, uh, Mayor Davis, if I recall the, the discussions, uh, it's because the germination period of the gypsy moths coming to an end. It, it wasn't, we were going to try this, uh, the pesticide area pesticide this year in the capital because we didn't want to actually have it into the operating um, because we do see that um, that life cycle towards the back end of it rather than putting it to operating. That's, that was my recollection, uh, recollection of uh, why we were putting it into capital this year. Okay. Last question. So why, if you're going to be on city parks, <clears throat> why Wyndham Hills? I think I know the answer. Uh, as a, 
and why wouldn't it go beyond that? Uh, through uh, through the chair to the mayor, it's really focused on the areas where the you know, the habitat that attracts these gypsy moths is concentrated. So the other parts of the city don't have the same kinds of tree cover that where there'd be less of an area. So if the uh, the 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 high number of mature oak trees in these in this particular neighborhood makes it a particular target, and that um, <laughs> unfortunately perhaps is not the case in other areas of the city uh, because that's a beautiful uh, beautiful asset to the neighborhood but it's not something that we need to do everywhere because the 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 the, the types of trees that uh, foster the gypsy moths are just not everywhere through the city okay all right thanks mr chair Gus carpenter uh, thank you for that uh, and the, when you talk about the life cycle in the uh, where uh, are we not in the uh, final year of the life cycle or the last two years of the life cycle for the gypsy moth? <clears throat> Sorry, uh, uh, Councillor Carpenter, through the chair to you. That's right. This we are anticipating. This is probably the the the, the end of the cycle. Is this this year? And uh, by building it into the operating budget, then it becomes kind of a, an annual thing. By leaving it in capital, then it can be uh, uh, focused at the time of uh, the cycle when it's needed. And I would encourage you to connect with the GRCA because we've had this discussion at GRCA and they have a lot of properties. They deal with a lot of gypsy moss issues and they've got some expertise on the life cycle and where we are with the gypsy yeah. moth in the Grand River watershed. So I just would encourage you to, to connect with them for some expertise on, on the timing and the life cycle. Thank, Thank you for that. We will do that. Thank you. Seeing nothing further on this one. Uh, C43, Lauren Park Gazebo, Mayor Davis. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Really just an, an information piece. So how big will the gaze gazebo be? Uh, where will it be in the Lauren Park? <clears throat> and um, how do how will people access it? Will it just be free for use or like what it'll be similar to the one in Mohawk Park or just a little bit more information if you can, please? Through the chair to you, Mayor Davis. Um, it, I believe the location um, at this time is um, in Lauren Park, which is just off of the Lauren Bridge. Um, yeah, where, where, in the the park, where in the park? Yes, where in the park? I believe it is in the area that is, is paved at the moment. Um, well, how about if you look behind uh, Councillor Sicoli? I think she's got a picture of it. I cannot see Councillor Sicoli. <laughs> Vicky's on the line, Jen. Maybe Vicky yes. can provide some more detail. Through uh, the chair, I can answer that question. So the gazebo will be, I don't know, there's a lot of people here who, who remember Lauren Park. So it's going to be in the location where the, close to where the previous gazebo was. I don't know if anyone remembers that gazebo that was, previously in the park, but it is um, closer to the uh, Ballantyne Drive intersection, closer to that end of the park. And it includes a small trail connection um, so that people can access it easily. The intention is for the public, the general public to access it. Um, in the past, and even to this day, there's a lot of people who take get their wedding pictures taken in the park. And so it's really to enhance that. It's to enhance the, the look of the park. It's meant to be ornamental in nature. So it, it's not anything like the picnic shelters that we have at Mohawk Park. It's more of an ornamental gazebo. Um, we don't really have anything like that in town, but more similar to the little gazebo that's in Glenhurst Gardens, if, if there's anything to equate it to. Yeah, so a, a bit larger. Yeah. So not like the one in Mohawk Park. No. No. Okay. And what's the architectural theme going to be? Is it like going to be historically? We have a certain image of gazebos. If we think yeah. of historically, is it going to be more modern, or what's the style going to be? I'm going to say that it's going to. There, it will definitely complement a more Victorian style nature uh, of the park. It may not look specifically Victorian, but it will definitely have that flavor. Um, it hasn't been designed yet, so I can't tell you the specifics of it. But that's generally the sort of the idea. Yeah, I would think for this being one of our most historical parks, yeah. hopefully it'll be Victorian in nature. Thank you very much, Mr. 
Councilor McCurry. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, hi, Vicki. Um, hi. Can you remind me what year we did the Lauren Park Master Plan? Through the chair to Councilor McCreary, I believe it was in 2004. I think you're right. Uh, the other piece was to acquire the service station next door. Uh, we never had a chance to do that, did we? No, I don't no. think we did. Now, uh, so if people think of a band shell, that's kind of like what the gazebo is, right? Uh, through the chair, yes, it, it could it could look similar to that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's uh, so. Is it? It's it's going to be closer to to one Sherwood or closer to Colburn Street? Uh, closer to one Sherwood, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, in light of some of the societal issues that uh, we've enjoyed lately in the, in the, in the neighborhood, uh, might we want to rethink the location to put it closer to line of sight on Colburn? Um, that is something that can be looked at. Um, I, I'll leave I that think, with you. I think either way, it has to have some lighting, a lighting component to it, definitely. Yeah, so yeah. somewhere where it's visible to passerby is, is definitely something that we would want. Yes, thank you. That was my next question was about adequate lighting. Um, and can you explain uh, the funding here? We've got $100,000 prior approved. Did that come from somebody else? Um, through the chair to Councillor McCreary, yes. The funding was a donation from a private resident who wanted to enhance the park. So okay. I think the design, some of the design that, um, features that have been looked at, there's just, I think they're just topping up that funding for now. So is that someone, someone that we're gonna celebrate or is it anonymous? What's, uh, can you explain that? I don't ability? believe they, to my, I, to my knowledge, I don't believe they wanted recognition, but okay. we may seek, we may ask their, we may ask after it's designed and, and installed. Yeah, that, I think that would, I think that would be a, a worthwhile chat to have Vicki. Excellent, thanks. It's, it's been a long time coming, eh? Yes, it has. Yeah, thank you. Councillor yeah, Sless. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, is the is the design envisioned to be similar to what was there? Th that was quite small, actually, the, the gazebo that was there. Through the chair to Councillor Sless, the intent of the intent of the gazebo is the same, but the the, the actual size and it will that the, the it will look a lot more uh, prominent and um, visually. Um, uh, have a lot more character than the old one. The old one was actually donated from the home builders at the time, but it, it was quite small. So it, the new one, um, the designs that I've seen, there's seating inside the gazebo. There's enough room for that. It's not huge, but like it, it's, it's say triple the size of the previous one, I would say. Okay. And, and is it being designed, uh, keeping in mind that it is a uh, prominent place for wedding pictures that, that, it, that it can accommodate that uh, once it's completed? it's designed in that it can accommodate photographs with like openings on two sides and seating inside. It's not meant for a giant wedding party. It would be meant for more of a small wedding party, the bride and groom and, and the, but not like, it's not, it's not meant for a giant uh, wedding party by any means. No. Okay. The park right. is just too small. Yep. And, and I, I too would like to uh, urge you as Councillor McCurry did that, uh, that we do, celebrate the folks that, uh, you know, hopefully that they will allow their name to stand and, and we can honor them in a way that I think that's appropriate for coming forward because the park's been without a gazebo for quite a while now. So it would be nice to get that back in there. It'll look nice. So thank you. Seeing nothing further on this. Uh, Councilor McCurry, Lauren Bridge, new trail alignment. Chair, sure, thank you very much through you to staff. Um, this is uh, this is to alleviate some significant safety concerns which exist now on the uh, the uh, trail that passes beneath the Lauren Bridge. We've had some serious accidents there, uh, one life changing accident a number of years ago. Um, so the new alignment will take it in a level sort of condition. Uh, where the trail currently dips down beneath the bridge is it our intention to maintain um, access down to below the bridge, but to be deterring bicycle traffic by having it only half as, half as long as it is now? 
Through you, Chair Martin. Uh, Councilor McCure, we're going to look into that, whether it just becomes a pedestrian only or whether we remove it or what the options are during our design phase, um, just to make sure that uh, it's, everything's completely visible, safe uh, access for that. But um, <clears throat> right now, I think cyclists are going to stay on that old rail trail under the culvert uh, piece and review what, what actually would be uh, what use would be for that that piece that runs closer to the water yeah it, it is essential indeed though to deny use to cyclists there if we're going to be building the um the uh, diversion yeah that's right yeah thank you yeah this is one that definitely needs to move forward okay that ends this sheet let's move on to 51 through 63. Do we have any separations on this page? Mm. Councillor Wall. Uh, 50, 9C50. 50 uh, has been removed. That's uh, been identified as staff for removal. That's why you didn't mention it. My apologies, Chair Martin. Okay. Any other separations? Okay, we'll go to the next page, 64 to 77. Mayor Davis. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, sticking with the page you just left, quick question on number 60. Go ahead. I guess this one goes to Selby through you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, our award-winning, gold award-winning wastewater treatment facility. Um, and doing even better on it. So what what exactly will, because right now this is the that last stage of disinfection before one of the last stages before the water is sent back to the river. Is that the idea? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to um, our mayor. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, you are correct. That is uh, actually the last stage. Disinfection right. is the last stage before going to the river. And so right now, I, when I was down there, there's a lot of chlorine. Well, not a lot, but it's that's what's being used right now, right? Um, so we use a chlorine to disinfect and then we dechlorinate with the chemical. Yeah. So we, we remove the chlorine from the water before we putting it in the Grand River. Great. And so the UV filter will do all of that. You won't need to use the chemicals anymore. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're finding that the technology has improved. The UV, uh, we don't have to add a chemical and remove. Instead, the UV disinfection will do a better job. So maybe we'll get triple gold once it's finished. <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, what will that uh, reduce some of our operating costs then? Because you're not buying chemicals or... Um, we are hearing this will be investigated further once we look into the details of the project, but our preliminary investigation showed that the cost for using chlorine and UV, the operating budget, would be the same. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And uh, <clears throat> as I said, uh, uh, great work by your staff and continue to improve the facilities they oversee. Being, of course, the other end is treating the water and for drinking and the other end being wastewater treatment. You're doing Great job and is being recognized uh, through the watershed. So. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Wall. Uh, 9C74. Councillor McCurry. Uh, number 76. Okay, seeing nothing further, Councillor Wall, you're first with the Deluzi building and tower facade repairs. Fantastic. Uh, is there any way to move this down the road? You can give it a try. Sorry, that's a question for staff. Um, is this time sensitive? Is the building going to fall over if we don't do this? Do you, uh, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Wall, there are a number of facade uh, portions of the building. I'm not sure if you can hear me okay, but there are a number of uh, facade areas, particularly on the north wall, where the uh, over time the uh, 
the marble and the uh, the particularly the higher level stonework does need some attention so that it doesn't become a safety issue. Uh, there are some places where it's starting to uh, look like it might need to be readhered before it starts falling on folks walking by on the sidewalk. So we're not in the position now where it is a safety hazard, but it is this work will uh, prevent us from getting there. I would prefer not to defer it any further than it already has been. That building's seen a lot of use over the years and particularly now that it's our city hall, we wanna make sure that it's in tip top shape all the way around. Yeah, I uh, obviously safety is paramount concern. Um, we've just put a lot of money into that building and uh, now we're putting more into it. Is it possible, you know, I'm always looking for that compromise. Is it possible maybe to do a portion of this funding right now to take care of the things that are just of utmost importance and then continue some of it next year? You, um, Mr. Chair to Councillor Wall, you, you are correct. We have spent an awful lot of money on the inside of this building uh, in the last number of years, but very little of that project was related to the outside of the, of the, of the building. And that's what this piece will pick up and uh, kind of make, put the finishing touches onto our new city hall. Yeah, so I know that that is not necessarily your fault or anybody's particular fault, but I mean, I don't necessarily agree with like, that was presented to us as like this one big project inside or outside. I guess I think I heard you say, no, we can't triage this more. Uh, through you, uh, the chair, staff went very carefully through the budget, but before it came to council and weeded out the felt those that we felt could be pushed off and this is not one of those we felt was wise to do so okay i'll take your advice thank you Councilor carpenter thank you uh, thank you uh rick for your for your responses now this we this already has a, a prior approval of 120,000. is that correct Just pulling it up, Councillor Carpenter, to make sure I'm looking at the same thing you are. Three seventy four, three eighty four. Sorry, I'm off. I'm off by a, a few here. Hold on a second. Yeah, three eighty four. Yeah. Yep. There has been some uh, pre-engineering work. Uh, the studies are design the 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 work to design what is necessary to be done. That's the part that has been accomplished to date. And the money for um, 2022 is to actually start implementing some of the, the repairs that have been identified through that pre-work. And we That's have correct. half million, and we have half million dedicated to next year. Uh, is that for similar outside work or is that inside as well? So all of all, this is entirely, uh, this project is entirely um, outside and, and on the tower. This is not inside work. So this is just the tower itself. And, and I see it also includes the clock or it may include the clock, I should say. It may include the clock, yes. So this repointing is necessary to, to prevent the, uh, the, to prevent further damage, water damage getting in there and uh, freezing and, and uh, expanding. And, yes. And, yes. Yeah. So this, is this is a matter of pay me now or pay me a lot more later? That's correct. Okay, and the five hundred thousand for next year is that slated for anything? I'm, I'll have to get back to you on the details of how the fa the phase was broken down between twenty twenty two and twenty twenty three, Council Carpenter. I'm sorry, I don't I, have that information right at my I, fingertips. I appreciate, I appreciate that, Rick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Pintelberg. So was this budgeted previously? Through the chair, uh, this has been part of the capital plan for more than just this particular budget cycle. Yes, Councilor Van Tilburg, it has been in the budget pre so, area, previous so to today. It was brought to our attention that we were going to need significant outside work on the building. And that was known when we purchased it as well. I wasn't around at the time of the purchase, Councillor Van Tilborg, but it was certainly known prior to this year and pri prior to the completion of the previous project inside. Very good. Thank you. It's a lot of money. Is 
Seeing nothing further on this one, we'll move on to 76. Councilor McCurry, concrete assessment and repairs. Sure, Mark, thank Senator you. Parkade. Thank you, through you to staff. Um, the, um, we, uh, this, this Park 8 has been a money pit since the day it was built, uh, not constructed properly, uh, some pretty poor materials used, and uh, it's been all downhill since then. Um, could staff indicate the capacity and the average usage of this parkade, please? Through the chair, uh, Councilor uh, McCreary, I'm going to have to get that information for you. The actual operators of the parking, we, we, we manage the facility, but we don't operate the parking. So I will have to get that information from my colleagues in PLSP and get back to you. That'd be excellent, Rick. Thank you very much for that. I wonder if also we could have an analysis of the um, the money that we've spent uh, with respect to maintenance and repairs there, say for the last uh, 10 years. And um, if we could also get an estimate of what the cost would be to demolish the structure and return to surface parking on the site. Uh, through you, Chair Martin, Councilor McCreary, a similar memo was provided to Councilor, uh, Council uh, last year, so I can bring that back. Uh, it did have the demolition costs. Yeah, that'd be excellent. And I think it's a worthwhile discussion to have during this capital cycle. We can send that. Councilor Carpenter. Yes, and uh, thank you, Andy. And with, I think I recall that report, that report, if it didn't include it, uh, could you also include what, what would the cost be to rebuild the structure, build a new parking garage of this size? And I do recall the area where the problem with this site was the sealer was experimental at the time that the uh, then council used prior to both Council McCurry and count my time. Uh, the sealer didn't work and didn't seal, which is probably the most important part of a parking garage is to seal it so that the salt doesn't get into the rebar. So uh, do we always, all, uh, part of that assessment, do we get the assessment of whether the rebar inside is rusted and what actual safe, you know, how safe that parking garage is? We don't want an issue like, like what happened up north. Through you, uh... Uh, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Carpenter, yes, the assessment of the concrete and the uh, metal is, we're continually keeping an eye on it. We certainly don't want to uh, repeat the errors of uh, our colleagues north of here. Yeah, and we know we're speaking of Elliot Lake, right? Thank you. Okay, that finishes this page. And we're approaching eight o'clock. Does the majority of council want to keep going or call it a night? Thumbs up for keep going. Bye bye for. I move a motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay, a motion to recess by Councillor Carpenter. Do we have a seconder? A bunch of seconders. <laughs> okay, so before we leave, we'll uh, get an update on where we stand and then we'll pick this up at uh, C-78. Uh, three, Chair Martin, the 2022 capital budget was increased $100,000 this evening because of the increase for the trail safety improvement project. So that 2022 <laughs> capital budget is now 134 million. $364,553. The remainder of the forecast remains unchanged. 1 million, sorry, 1 billion, 114 million, 416,752 dollars. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll recess until Monday. Thank You're you, all everyone. incredible people. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good, night. Good work. Good work, Mr. Chair. Good job, staff. Good night. Good night.